everyone, sorry for the delay. We will now begin the first panel of the day. Meetha will introduce the panel on mental health law and policy. Good morning everyone. Um, I think today is quite, um, we, our panel has quite a varied, um, I mean it comes from a very varied perspective. We have, uh, we'll begin with Dr. Chandrasekhar, um, move on to Mr. Rahul Shidai. Um, then we have Ms. Amba Salilkar, we have Ms. Reshma Valiapan and uh, Ms. Vaishnavi Jayakumar and um, we'll have Ms. Uh, Shubha uh, moderating the panel and I think with all the discussions that we had yesterday related to public health and privacy, mental health has somewhere been at the back of all of this. So I think it makes sense to sort of move on to uh, the issues facing mental health in India, especially like this, the social stigma and we do have the Mental Health Care Act of 2017 which has uh, both been uh, criticized as well as hailed. So I think we'll get a good perspective from our uh, very panel today. So I'd like to invite Ms. Shubha to um, just introduce the panelists and then we could get started. Thank you. Um, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the first session. Um, I'd like to first uh, call all the panelists to come and uh, to the stage. So I have been given this task of moderator which I am realizing is turning out to be both chairing as well as a discussant role. Uh, so I am going to try and do justice to both the task of you know timekeeping as well as moderating the discussions and the uh, questions. Um, uh, so let me um, first uh, you know say a few words about how we will go about this session and then I would like to introduce the speakers. Um, so we have we have five speakers for this morning session, and um, what um, we will be having all of them speak one after another, their perspectives on uh, mental health, um, and then we will be taking questions towards the end of it. Now I understand that you know retaining sort of five five talks one after another, you know, uh, listening to all of them and then holding on to your questions is, uh, is going to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but I think if we want to give sufficient time to, you know, both the speakers as well as, you know, the, um, the participants and to have enough time for discussion, then we will have to keep the, you know, questions towards the end. So I'm going to request you to, you know, hold on to your questions and make a note of them. Um, and we will, we will have about, um, 20 minutes for each speaker, right? I think that will leave us then with about half an hour for a discussion. Uh, so let me just go ahead and introduce um, the first speaker, um, Dr. K. Chandrasekhar. He is a founding director, managing director and senior consultant at Asha Hospital, Hyderabad. Um, Asha Hospital is a postgraduate training center for psychiatry, child psychiatry, clinical psychology and mental health nursing. He has been the president of the prestigious um, Indian Psychiatric Society South Zone and vice president of Alzheimer's and Related Disorders um, Society India, the Hyderabad Deccan chapter. And uh, those of you who are familiar with Hyderabad would know that Asha Hospital in the field of mental health is quite a well-known uh, figure actually, it's quite a well-known uh, name within the private uh, uh, mental health service sector and for certain reasons it stands out as being quite different from some of the others which I think Dr. Chandrasekhar will perhaps throw light on in his talk. So can I invite Dr. Chandrasekhar to please start your presentation. A good morning to all of you. Mental health 
as a component of public health has long been neglected as most of you might be familiar with. No one thought that mental health will be an issue in the realm of public health because for decades we have been concentrating on communicable diseases. Of course, we haven't reached the goal yet, even in communicable diseases in the health sector. But at the same time, we tend to see that mental health has been re relegated, not only in terms of uh, according its due place, but also in the budgetary sanctions of the various governments. Though health is the least uh, priority as far as the budgetary sanctions are concerned, and mental health gets the lowest priority even in those budgetary sanctions. If you have seen this particular document, New Pathways, New Hope, the Mental Health Policy of 2014, I think some of you might have gone through the document. It is nothing short of an election manifesto. Nothing beyond that. It doesn't look like a health policy statement at all. What we see in that is trying to paint a very, very rosy picture of the health services availability in the country and say that we are going to achieve this. This is one of the drawbacks. When we frame a policy, I think one of the things which we should really look into is whether this policy is implementable or not. We have several policies for several documents which ultimately at the ground we see they are unimplementable and really don't achieve any results. Next. India's new policy aims to close gaps in mental health care. This article came exactly a month later the policy was released. In 2014, October, this policy was released. And uh, November, this article was written in the, one of the prestigious medical journals in the world, Lancet. What categorically means is, what questions remain about its implementation. The policy is welcome in most of the circles, but the basic questions remain whether it can be implemented at all in a country like India. The National Mental Health Policy 2014, one of the basic uh, background to start documenting this policy is the 65th World Health Assembly held in 2013, where India again ratified. I think our Indian government ratifies a lot of things without even thinking, right, UNCR party convention also. So this was ratified by India saying that the backbone of this document is that mental health services should be provided within the existing healthcare system using PHC approach. Any one of us who have worked in PHCs and really know the structure of PHCs in India, they are largely catering to the infectious diseases and maternal health, nothing beyond that. And even that, the organization of PHCs differ from state to state. In some states they are well organized in some states, you don't see a doctor even in a PSC. In majority of the states, PSCs are inaccessible to, in spite of being in the village setup, most of them become inaccessible because of lack of staff, lack of coordination among the staff. And this PSC approach, though a very good approach in the rest of the world, probably in India, I think it is always a moot point whether our PSC approach is really going to work in several sort of instances. So the mental health policy again depends upon this particular thing that we have to have a PSC integration with the mental health care. I will come to that how it is difficult. Next. The main issues in the mental health policy is some mental, it recognizes that all mental illnesses are not short term things. There are chronic illnesses which needs long term care. It, it doesn't go off with or uh, with just a consultation and a counselling, there are a lot of illnesses where we have to have a very, very chronic long-term care. And it should address the needs of the persons with mental illness, their care providers and healthcare professionals. Unlike other physical disorders, the burden on the families and the caregivers is extremely high in the case of mental illnesses. There are a lot of physical illnesses where probably if you tackle the individual needs, you are 
doing justice or you are reaching the goal. But whereas it comes to mental illnesses, you have to also look into the needs of the carers, which is a, a very important issue. Service users and caregivers should be involved in planning the development, delivery, monitoring and evaluation of mental health services. This is always more written in the documents rather than really practiced. The government has a major role in actions for promotion of mental health, prevention of mental illness and treatment of mental illness in the country. And the government alone, the document clearly mentions that the government alone, at least there is an element of uh, uh, this, uh, that private uh, partners, private care should be integrated with the governmental care. Government alone cannot ensure effective delivery. <coughs> Other stakeholders such as private care providers, civil society organizations, user groups, academic and research institutes also have a crucial role in delivery and guiding the policy. Next one. So what are the challenges we have with this sort of a policy? The providing services within the framework of the policy is one of the basic, I think, limitations of this policy. Address both medical and non-medical aspects of the mental health. One of the uh, 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 basic issues which this policy talks about is mental health issues versus mental illnesses. Anywhere, any, any person in the world you can think of does have a mental health issue sometime or other in his lifetime. There is no one who can boast that I am mentally 100% okay. So mental health issues have a long range in the sense that the economic, social, cultural, so many issues which uh, are influencing the mental health issues in a given individual. When you combine in a mental health policy the mental health issues with mental illnesses, the emphasis is taken away from the real core issues. The budgetary sanctions can re really change across time. Someone will say that I am going to talk about a cultural thing and you sanction me this much budget in a policy. And the mental health illnesses which really need the budget or deprived of that. So I think in a policy, it's a health policy and we have to limit it to the health issues rather than bringing every human. These are the problems of living. A lot of mental health issues can be just problems of living. The poverty, the migration, uh, uh, rural urban divide, the economic divide, all those things can produce some amount of restlessness, some amount of mental or sort of a stress in a given individual. And when you bring the mental illnesses along with this issue, it becomes so huge and vast that you will not be able to manage anything. You will not be able to do justice to either of them. So what are the ground realities we have really in the case of psychiatric or the mental health services in the country? Next. So if you look at the population of India, I am sure, and this is the latest National Mental Health Survey 2016 which talks about the disorders, prevalence of disorders, these are all serious mental disorders and about more than 10.6 crores suffering from about four serious mental disorders in the country. And the treatment gap, you look at the treatment gap, almost more than 80 percent. That means only 20 percent of the population who suffer from these disorders really get the needed treatment. Rest 70 to 80 percent are left. This is an important thing. How many mental hospitals are there in the country? 47, with the number of beds. The total number of beds in a population of the country and with a population of 10.6 crores of mentally ill people, you have 50,000 beds all of the country, put both in the private sector and the government sector. One can argue that we are more into community care, not the hospital-based care. Let me tell you, community-based care is an important issue, but it is not going to replace the hospital-based care as far as the mental health is concerned. There are serious mental illnesses which need hospital-based care, and one cannot wish away the problem. Your community-based care can probably cater to needs of minor mental disorders. I'll come to that. Now the next one, please. Again, this is the same survey which talks about what are the number of beds available across the world. Globally, it is 6.5 for 1 lakh population, but in India, it is about 2.15 for 1 lakh population, which is absolutely low. 
the reason I am uh, raising this particular point is that somewhere about two, three decades ago, I think it was three decades ago, there was a policy decision taken by the government and also majority of the psychiatric community that no more mental hospitals in the country. So they stopped at that 47 or 42, whatever the thing, uh, three decades ago, and didn't establish a single mental hospital in the country. But what was the population of the country 30 years ago? And what is the population today? I mean, absolutely there is no comparison. And I think this is where we have really, most of the psychiatrists have made a big mistake in saying that community care is going to take care of the entire mental health, which is, uh, again, I would say, a, very difficult to really achieve in a country like India. The next one, please. So, what was the approach taken by the mental health policy framers is that mental health services should be provided in the existing health care system using primary health care approach. This is the policy document which says. Next one, please. So, integration of mental health into primary care. There are hardly any examples of attempts to integrate mental health into general health care or non-communicable diseases and examples of intersectoral uh, coordination of mental health care. It was in 1982, more than three decades ago, that a plan was made to integrate mental health into general health care. And still after 40 years, we are still talking about it, how to integrate. So, th please. This was a report. This is not an impression. This was a report given by the Technical Committee on Mental Health constituted by National Human Rights Commission, by uh, Dr. Pratima Murthy and others from NIMHANS, and this was published in 2016. In 2016, you say that there are no way of integrating it and still talk about a policy which says that is going to be my primary approach. Next one. One of the uh, common things, common uh, statements made by the policy makers is we have a beautiful NMHP, National Mental Health Program, and uh, DMHP, District Mental Health Program. This National Mental Health Program came into being somewhere when I was a student 40 years ago, <laughs> 1982. I was a student at the time when it started. Imagine that after almost 40 years, not even one third of the country is covered. If a policy you cannot implement, if a program which you cannot implement in 30, 40 years and still continue to harp on that as the basic policy of mental health care, I think there is something wrong with us. I, I enact a policy, I will see its results within say uh, maximum in the public health, maybe 5 years or 10 years and if it is not working, the policy should be thrown out. There is no way of continuing with that policy and saying that we are going to implement it. The questions, there are a lot of questions which arise. You see the journey of this uh, DM and HP. For almost 15 years, there are only two or three districts in the country which are implementing it. And there is no coordination between the state and the central government health care systems here at all because the very few districts which implemented this policy because of the interest of the local psychiatrists or the local healthcare professionals, not because of the government policy. So in the 11th plan implemented in 123 districts, how many districts are there in India? More than 600, if I am right, 653 or something. If 32, if after 40 years of announcing a policy and at the end of 40 years, you say that only not even one third of the country is covered, is that policy really worth looking at? Is the program really worth looking at? This is a very debatable question and people should think of it. Can the NHP and DMNHP in their present form really fulfill their roles in the delivery of mental health care along the lines envisaged by the National Mental Health Policy? I have my own doubts. I think this cannot be done the way they are thinking at present. For the simple reason that mental illness is not a unitary disease. If I say that is a uh, three minutes, yeah. So if I say that I am doing a malaria control program or a tuberculosis control program or STD control program, whatever it is, I have a policy there. But mental illness is not a unitary thing, and you have common mental disorders, depression, anxiety, stress-related somatization. 
these are the things which your community care can take off but not the severe mental disorders which community alone cannot render to next one providing mental health service is a challenging task which needs from infrastructural changes and the next one so the real stakeholders in any mental health policy are the patient the family community the ngos and the policy makers and mental health professional unless these the entire gamut of these people come together and really chalk out a policy nothing is going to be implemented this is one of the alternative models which i was thinking for a long time see you have to establish something like a district mental health trust where everyone is a partner mental health professionals civil society members carers family members of the mental ill government and ngos and you draw the human resources across from the private sector and the public sector and you offer the services whatever the services which are needed for the mentally ill for the next one so psc now if you are do, going with the general practitioner and training him on all those things is not going to work out it has not worked out for the last 40 years so what see now almost every district has got a medical college every medical college has a psychiatric department they have to adapt the local psc's and run the psychiatric clinic the psc is not training the medical officers there as the services go on they may be trained but not i train a uh, gp and send him into the psc it is not going to work out it has never worked in the last 30 years so can uh, uh, running a fortnightly psychiatric clinic in association with the human resources available in the district is the policy and it need not be a philanthropy again lot of times people think that if i go to a center it has to be a philanthropy uh, leaving my clinic in the same urban area and going to rural thing not necessary the district mental health trust can be set up which can give monetary compensation for hospitalization for also the outpatient services and so on and so forth so the models have to be rethought models have to be reframed no longer your face you can you contact see the question of undergraduate medical education in psychiatry psychiatric specialty given the due importance undergraduate medical education was there for the last 40 years you take up any psychiatry journal even today they keep talking about it we should improve the psychiatric undergraduate psychiatric uh education so these are the policies which have failed in the last 30 40 years and i think we have to have something like a disruptive model where we say throw out that policy let me think let me get onto the ground and let me see what i can do at the current level of available services across in the community unless someone does that i think this uh, this mental health policy or any future health policies are not going to work out as far as the mental health is concerned thank you thank you dr chandrashekar and i should apologize in advance to all the speakers for um, you know drawing their attention to the time but i do want to try and see that we have sufficient time for you know also some discussions and questions at the end um so th in the interest of that uh, can i now request um, dr rahul um, shidhaye to uh, please uh, give his presentation um dr rahul shidhaye is a clinical psychiatrist and epidemiologist and has worked in the area of clinical psychiatry and public mental health for the last 14 years and he has also taken up various um, other research related roles um, in his career including as a co principal investigator on the vishram project that's the vidarbha stress and health program which was a community based mental health program to address psychosocial distress of suicide affected rural communities in the vidarbha regions of uh, maharashtra matra a very good morning to all of you and thank you so much for that introduction uh, i'm going to probably compensate for the rest of the uh, speakers time i do not have a formal powerpoint presentation i'm going to speak directly to you uh, using some of my uh, points uh, so before i start my presentation today uh, i i just recollected the story of uh, elephant and six blind men 
So, um, and, and probably most of you must be aware of that particular story where um, each blind person uh, touches the elephant and they try to kind of describe the elephant based on their own perspective and uh, what kind of part of the elephant they have touched upon. So I think what I'm going to speak about is also my perspective of what I understand from uh, mental health issues and public mental health and what is the intersection of public health and mental health. So uh, please forgive me for, for my own interpretations which are based on my own experiences, which are based on whatever I've done till now. Uh, when I accepted the invitation for this particular talk, the first question came to my mind was why students in a law college or a law university would be interested to listen to someone like, uh, like me who is a psychiatrist, a, a public health psychiatrist who has worked in the field of public mental health. Uh, so I think most of you who are uh, sitting as participants over here would be kind of asking that question to you as, uh, yourself as well, that why you should be sitting and uh, speaking to me, uh, listening to me over next, uh, let us say, uh, 10 minutes or so. So I'll try to kind of un give answer to that particular question as, as I move along because I see that there is a scope for some kind of an interdisciplinary uh, work over here where there are overlaps between uh, law advocacy and the kind of work which we uh, do on ground in terms of providing services as well as uh, uh, building public mental health programs. So I'm going to kind of answer uh, three questions uh, in the next 10 minutes. First is, kind of from my perspective, what's the big challenge? And I see that from a perspective of a psychiatrist, of someone who is supposed to deliver services to people with mental disorders. Um, then the second question is, what are the key opportunities we have at this point of time? And finally, uh, I would like to answer this third question, uh, which is how to translate the broader vision into practice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for being very outspoken. I have kind of uh, um, I've been, uh, I've spoken at global uh, mental health platforms, participated in various world health organization meetings and so on and so forth. But I haven't really heard someone uh, uh, like Dr. Chandrasekhar who has very clearly said that if policies have not worked, then we have to take a serious look at that and, and do we really mean anything by that. So thank you so much for being provocative. Um, I, I, I don't think I'll be, I can be as provocative as you are, I, I probably won't be even responding to you. Uh, but I'll try to kind of give my own version of whether it is to some extent possible to translate uh, some of the visions in the policy document into practice. Again, this should be seen as a complementary kind of a discussion and not so much as a debate. I mean, it could be converted into a debate as well. So let me start with what I think as the big challenge. Again, this is not from someone who has suffered from a mental illness. That could be a completely different kind of a take on it. As a psychiatrist who has actually not suffered from any mental illness, but have seen people suffering from these particular disorders, what I feel the big challenge is that a lot of people with these disorders do not have access to services. Um, people with these disorders do not get the kind of care which is required. And uh, initially I was not a believer in uh, uh, in drugs, in psychotropic drugs and even counselling therapies, though I joined the, the, uh, the stream of psychiatry, but over a period of time I have come to realise that these things do work. So if they work, then why people are not getting access to that? So that's the big question for me, how to kind of improve access to care and not just any care, but care which is provided with quality, which is, uh, which, which is effective, not just any kind of care which most of the times we kind of uh, tend to see in the communities. And then at what costs? So what are the resources used in, in that particular uh, uh, program or particular area of service where uh, uh, services are delivered? Because most of the times people with severe mental disorders end up uh, spending so much of their own income that they get bankrupt. I mean, uh, out-of-pocket expenditures are so high that the hydrogenic poverty is one of the consequences of mental illnesses. So that's the big challenge. Now, in terms of what are the opportunities at the policy level we have currently. Now, again, there could be a lot of debate on this particular issue, but I feel that the new Mental Health Care Act, uh, what it does, it kind of enshrines access to mental health care as a right of one of the many things what the act does, the right to mental health care is probably one of the most important things which again from my own perspective helps in improving access to mental health care if we kind of push that and, and kind of advocate for it. 
along with the, uh, the National Mental Health Care Act, the policy, the National uh, Health Policy, envisages delivery of mental health services as part of the universal access to care. Now, again, Dr. Chandrasekhar would kind of definitely would say that universal access to care itself is kind of a utopian idea, and uh, there are a lot of issues in terms of achieving it. Um, but I think chasing the utopia is probably kind of a, what we call as moonshot. By by some of those moonshot things, we we reach to some extent. So maybe it's not a bad kind of an idea to have some of these uh, utopian ideas as as our ideals and uh, trying to strive uh, to achieve them. Uh, and the third thing is a national health policy uh, which was recently launched in 2017 that also acknowledges uh, mental health as a thrust area and uh, uh, agrees that the uh, access to mental health care needs to be improved. So broadly we have a problem in terms of people are not getting services. We have a law which says that there, it is their right to uh, receive the services. Uh, the national mental health policy talks about including mental health care as part of the universal access to care. Now with that background, what are we going to do in order to translate this vision into practice? In next five minutes, what I want to kind of talk about is how we, how we can make efforts to translate that vision into practice. And you saw a very uh, de uh, depressing slide on the, the progress of district mental health program across the country. And I was, I was two years old when this program was launched. And since then, I've been hearing pretty much the same things. All the evaluation reports pretty much talk about talk about similar things. Five years ago, I got a chance uh, to lead a program in the state of Madhya Pradesh, uh, which was working with the district mental health program over there and trying to integrate mental health care in primary care. Integrating mental health care in primary care is definitely a utopian idea. Based on eight years of my work in Madhya Pradesh, I can vouch for that. It's not easy, but, but kind of efforts we made has resulted in some kind of a program initiated into there and what what we realized was that these are some of our learnings and and I'll just try to summarize them and this is where the people from the legal sector or the advocates can kind of pick up some of points and you can also try to kind of pick some of those issues and then kind of work on them so the first thing we realized was that uh, uh, we do have evidence based interventions we do have interventions which work now we have to kind of move from, from that point into kind of translating that into practice. The most important thing we need to understand is in what context or in what kind of a setting these interventions are delivered. So these interventions are delivered in a, either a private healthcare system, which I'm not going to talk about because that's not area of my expertise, neither I've worked in there. Uh, the other is public healthcare system. Now in public healthcare system, is, is that system strong enough or is it geared enough to kind of um, absorb these evidence-based interventions for mental health care and deliver them. That's the key question. It is not. Frankly speaking, it is not. It's the systemic issue. The health system is so poor uh, that for majority of their priority conditions, they are not able to deliver services. Mental health is far less in the priority. But then what, what should we be doing? I mean, should we be just kind of... Um, um, talking about it. I think no, there are a lot of people who have done a lot of efforts um, in this particular area. One example which I recollect from the Banyan's work where they advocated for uh, uh, supply of psychotropic drugs within the uh, district mental health program and this was an advocacy led by users and they got the drugs available in the PHC. Similarly in the state of Madhya Pradesh what we did was we, um, we not just worked on the drug systems but we also worked on getting uh, some of the medical officers and some of the um, uh, healthcare workers, the community healthcare workers to work for this particular aspect. So we ensured that there were resources allocated to mental health program there was some space allocated to mental health program within the healthcare facilities and we call that space as man kaksh so man man stands for mental and kaksh stands for a room or a place where services could be delivered we also ensured that along with drugs uh, the information or the data is regularly collected so these were some of the efforts which we did with the public health system again it is absolutely difficult to work with them it takes a whole lot of time but um, again based on our experience what we can say is that we were able to establish that broader healthcare context or broader system in which the services could be later on integrated 
then we kind of started initially uh, de uh, delivering the services for severe mental disorders, for common mental disorders such as depression and alcohol use disorders. And uh, our findings are currently under review. We have submitted it to the, uh, to the journals. Um, the f findings are quite positive in a sense that people do wish to take uh, avail those services. It's just that there are no services available. So I will not be too, too kind of uh, uh, um, focusing on increasing the awareness. Rather, I would provide the services first because if in absence of uh, uh, any awareness, uh, uh, in absence of uh, uh, services, what kind of awareness are, are we going to do and, and it's not going to help. So people are eager to receive services. Services could be delivered in the primary health care system. Again, this is only based on the work which we did. I'm not trying to generalize this particular uh, experience. This was the prime project in Madhya Pradesh, but there are ways in which that could be done. Systems need to be strengthened in order to do that. And one of the most important things which I realized was that we need to have some kind of an external facilitation team and a set of advocates. So advocates push at the level of the health policy and systems at the local level while the uh, the implementation uh, facilitation teams uh, these are like coaches they work with the local public health care system and something very similar to what dr chandrasekhar kind of showed in that last chart that you actually work together with them you provide services over there it's kind of a coaching kind of a thing so with with that kind of a approach where you have very clear idea of what you are going to provide. You advocate and work with the systems. You provide support from below and then work with the communities in order to move forward. At least in the context which I'm speaking, we were able to kind of achieve some results in terms of improved mental health care outcomes. If we, were, if we develop some of these implementation models, further work on this, it is likely that we can, we can move ahead. Uh, with, with the state government of Madhya Pradesh, it so happened that three years of relentless work with them actually uh, uh, got them interested uh, in, into this particular model. And then now they have kind of created Mankaksh, that is this particular model of delivery of services across the state. In all 51 district hospitals, they have created the Mankaksh. Madhya Pradesh is a huge state. It is bigger than United Kingdom with a population population as much as that of the United Kingdom. So this is not a small feat for a government which is actually like uh, at a very low levels of uh, health care indicators and we, we were very uh, 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 fortunate to be uh, partnering with them. My last point uh, is, is again bringing this all together for, for law students and you can play a very critical role in working with the governments to advocate some of these things, how to strengthen systems, how to get the data, how to get information systems in place, how to get dedicated human resource, how to get space for some of these things. You can, you can fight on behalf of people, patients and uh, uh, some of us who are working in the field of implementation research. And lastly, we are talking mostly about mental disorders. Uh, I think the, the whole idea is about mental health. Health and well-being is the idea. Um, as soon as we try to kind of address some of these disorders issue, we can move into the field of well-being and, 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 and also try to kind of see that mental health issues at large are addressed and uh, it kind of uh, encompasses the broader population with whom we are uh, talking about. Thank you so much for patient listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rahul. Um, I'd like to now call um, the next uh, speaker, um, who is a lawyer. Um, may I request her, Amba Salelkar. Um, and to introduce her, she's a board member of the Equal Center for Promotion of Social Justice, which focuses on ensuring the promotion of rights and fundamental freedom of persons with disabilities. She was a fellow of the Inclusive Planet Center for Disability Law and uh, Policy, Chennai. So I'd like to request her to um, give her perspective as a disability rights um, activist. Audible here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, wait, is this, is this audible? Yeah. So I, um, I am a lawyer and uh, since 2012 I am working on disability law and policy. A lot of my work is informed by the fact that since I was around 20 years old, so it's about 16 years now, I have been a user and survivor of psychiatry. Um, and uh, my experience is, I'm not going to go into diagnosis, but I mean I've also, I'm also a survivor of postpartum depression. Um, so, and that's fairly recent. So a lot of what I have to say, like, like Dr. Rahul was saying, is informed by where I, I come from and the people that I've worked with. 
Um, and, uh, you know, so I, um, you know, we, it's what, you know, this is, I, I plan to talk about one thing, but now I, I kind of feel that, you know, from the discussions we've had among participants and students over the last two evenings, um, there's some unpacking to be done around terminology because, you know, there's mental health and mental disorders and stuff. I'm going to spend a little time on that. Um, and uh, then I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the experiences of people with mental illness and navigating healthcare systems. Um, now, I am a product of privilege. So my experiences are not really indicative of what general is, and neither am I basing this on me search, as we like to say. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, th there are some, uh, so it's, it's a bit of both, I would say. Um, you know, so anyway, um, we talk about mental health, and as, as Dr. Rahul said, it's, it's more about, and, and, and Dr. Chandrasekhar as well, it's more about the idea of mental well-being, and there are a whole bunch of things. When people say they work on mental health, it could mean anything. Um, you know, I get very excited when I hear people working on mental health, and then they'll stop me and say, no, 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 no we don't do that. You know, like, we, we only do some things. Um, so, you know, and I, you know, a lot of m mental health is around stigma. Okay, and you know, there are many of us uh, who are now getting a little annoyed with this idea of anti-stigma because it isn't really leading anywhere for the person involved themselves. Um, so many of us believe that we need to start talking about discrimination against people mm. as opposed to just focusing on anti-stigma. But coming back to terminology, right? So there's this broad thing of mental health and mental disorders, I mean the presentation uh, by Dr. Chandrasekhar, gave you an idea of serious, not serious, whatever, mental, mental illnesses, um, mental disorders, mental illnesses. Um, there's another term that people use which is called psychosocial disability. Now, when we say mental illness, you know, a lot of people with mental illness um, do not identify as persons with psychosocial disabilities. Uh, the reasons are different. Some of them say that, oh, I don't want to call myself disabled because I don't need a parking space and I don't need a ration card and stuff. And I understand that, you know, there is there is a loaded sort of thing with disability. But, um, and, and I am actually, uh, it's, uh, you know, there is, there is like this, um, you know, I... Uh, Professor Amita Danda is not here, <laughs> and uh, I, I feel her presence, uh, 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 her absence rather. But you know, and I'm, I'm taking the risk of sitting in Nalsar and explaining these concepts, so forgive me. But you know, the idea is, is that mental illness is an impairment which people experience, um, and not all impairments necessarily lead to a disability. It's only when you have an impairment which actually interferes with your day-to-day -day life. I mean, there are barriers which exist. Um, when, when they come into contact with this experience of uh, impairment, that's what leads to a disability. Um, you know, like, so let's take another example. Let's say, you know, I use glasses, so I have a impairment of sight, but I really feel no barriers. I mean, it's fine. I wear glasses, I get along with my life. But, you know, there are people who are blind. And that is a disability because there is literally nothing which, I mean, there are no e-books available, there are no um, pathways which they can, they can use. So in some cases, we find that people with uh, mental illnesses do identify as persons with disabilities, especially when these conditions are chronic. Um, the other term that I want to use is a term that I, I use personally and, and many others do, which is the users and survivors of psychiatry. Sounds like a very dramatic term, um, but it is a term which has its roots almost in the 70s. Um, it is a civil rights movement, um, and it's a civil rights movement led by patients. Um, and it's interesting because you don't see too many diseases or you know conditions where you have patients actually taking to the streets and marching. I mean, you do, but. It's interesting, um, and uh, you know, Professor Danda led negotiations on the CRPD, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar and Dr. Chandrasekhar. I'm sorry, I come from Tamil Nadu. Um, so yeah. So anyway, the the thing is that these are are terms which people use to describe themselves. So I mean, the reason why I wanted to unpack this is because when we're looking at mental health, um, and you know, the way this is envisaged, it could mean a whole bunch of things. 
Now coming to the issue of, of stigma, this entire, this, this, this divide or this spectrum of mental health, which can mean everything from well-being to actually talking about people with, um, who experience very high restrictions on account of their impairments, um, it's weirdly sort of promoting this kind of stigma. Okay, so I, I was in, in a room with um, someone leading an NGO which is, you know, basically set up by a certain actress that I won't name, um, but dealing with mental health. And, you know, so he's saying that, oh, you know, we're dealing with mental health. And I said, oh, you know, that's great because and I'm telling him something about an organization he should go speak to that works with people, um, you know, who have been deinstitutionalized. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> We're only dealing with depression. We're not dealing with anything else. And this anything else, right? For me, it was like, you know, well, I, I wish I had the luxury of only dealing with depression in my life. You know, it was like, it's such, it's such, it's such a statement born of privilege. And of course, there are things that for people to do everywhere. I mean, like, you know, there's so much to do, so uh, no one can do wrong. That's the, that's the general emphasis in, in mental health. Um, but what I'm saying is that this is, you know, what, what happens is that sometimes we kind of believe that so many people are doing things on mental health, whereas actually we don't look at what the impact is on people living with mental illnesses, users and survivors, people with psychosocial uh, disabilities, what have you. Now I'm going to refer back to my notes. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's, um, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I've done this, da, da, da. right, so, you know, I'm going to limit my, my, my pet peeve on stigma and discrimination to administration of healthcare. And like I said, you know, people with, with mental illnesses, well, there's one thing is that mental illness, and Reshma's, I'm, I'm, Reshma's probably going to touch upon this in her presentation, but um, mental illness is something which is looked at from a medical lens, whereas we know that, for example, um, you know, the most sophisticated and modern theories are, you know, positing that psychiatric illness is caused by very complex uh, cyclical interactions of genetics, biology, psychology, environment, and social factors. Um, sometimes it tends to be looked upon as just a, a medical issue, whereas it's not. We've seen that in the case of, for example, Rohit Bemula, where the university says that he was depressed but nobody talks about the systemic factors which lead to depression. Um, in this case, um, caste, etc. Now, um, I, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, about, about, you know, the experiences of, of users and survivors of psychiatry in healthcare. Now, um, a lot has been said about the district mental health program. I was privileged to go and study the district mental health program in Tamil Nadu in the district of Kadalur where it's being led by a very um, enterprising uh, doctor, ex scarf who's now there, Dr. Satimurti. And, um, you know, when he started off the district mental health program, it was at the district hospital in Katalur. They had, like, a few beds and, and a clinic. Uh, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, uh, a nurse, and a data entry operator. So those of you who were there yesterday remember the conversations around that. And... Um, what was interesting was that what he told us is when he started off, there were literally five people coming a day, okay, to the district mental health program. And he was like, this is not, this cannot be indicative of an entire, um, you know, an, an entire district. So he actually spends the next six, eight months using his own generated funds and others to do awareness around, you know, about it's not witchcraft, it's anxiety and, you know, it's other sorts of things and raising awareness with the community. Um, so we, we go to, we, we, we're, we're at the district mental health program in, in Kadalur. We were doing a, a study on the cost of exclusion of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Um, so we're there and then he takes us to a satellite clinic, which is at this place called Kattamannar Koil, which is a good two hours from Kadalur. It's like the, the border of Kadalur and, and the next district. And there are 200 patients there in the satellite clinic who have traveled long distances to get there. These people, their families would earlier go to Kilpok, which is in Chennai, so it's a good six to seven hour drive, um, 
to get this medication. Then they would go the two hours to Kudlur Hospital. But now they go to a satellite clinic, which is still... Um, we, we spoke to one person who traveled 50 kilometers to get there. Um, but the, you know, because it, it covers so many conditions, um, it was incredible. 200 patients were seen in two hours. Okay? Um, and um, this is what happens every day. They go for satellite clinics like every other day, and this is the kind of response that they get in, in, in different satellite clinics. Um, we, we therefore have sufficient, uh, I mean, one of the presentations yesterday was on collation of data, and you know, there's this whole thing about, um, oh, mental illness is a huge issue, we need data, we need data on this. We have data through things like this. I mean, there's a data entry operator, they must be doing something, right? Um, so we, we do know, um, you know, that this is, that there are certain severe conditions. Um, but coming back to the administration of healthcare for persons with psychosocial disabilities and, and mental illness in general, I mean, there are two things. One is your access to mental health care, and the other is your access to other health care. Because, you know, we're people. We get sick, we get colds, we get pregnant, we want abortions, whatever it is, and there's this whole range of services. And incidentally, I mean, you know, after the passage of the Leprosy Act, people with mental illness are still the only people with supposed illnesses that still are barred from doing things which are not health-related, you know? Like, I mean, in the sense there are divorce laws which allow you to get divorced because, you know, um, allow you to seek divorce on the grounds of mental illness. Uh, voting has been a challenge. I don't know if, you know, we've, we've been trying for a very long time to get vote registrations done in mental hospitals, which successfully happened last, the last election um, round, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are so many examples. But the idea is, is that, you know, mental illness is, is, is deems to make you, make you unqualified for a lot of things because it, it is at the heart of your decision-making abilities. Um, so, you know, when we, you know, so when you had people talking about what is access to healthcare, I mean, globally, you have people who've experienced ECT, they've experienced forced institutionalization. I have avoided forced institutionalization by the skin of my teeth. Um, uh, and, you know, over medicalization, under medicalization, what have you, I mean, medication, sorry. Um, and you know, this, this is experience which you have to consider when you're talking about mental health policy because it's not going to, you're, you're making policy for people and you need to listen to them. And I think this is true of, of all, um, all, all healthcare. Um, and you know, there is this, this whole thing about, you know, this presentation about 40 years ago, they decided to make mental health part of the general health delivery system. And I don't believe that because there's still a separate mental health law. <laughs> Like, if you really wanted that, why don't you just have a health law which covers everything, right? Why do you have a separate mental health law and a separate HIV law and a separate, you know, like, there are all these things. And, um, you know, uh, Vivek Devan is here um, uh, as well who might talk about this. But, you know, the, the thing is that, and the reason why there is a separate mental health law is really because people with mental illnesses cannot take decisions for themselves and that, you know, we need a system in place which allows us to take decisions for them. And... Um, you know, the thing is that it is, I'm, I'm not here to talk about, I'm not, I'm not the expert, um, I'm not here to talk about um, whether or not that is a desirable thing, at least not, not, not in the five minutes I have left. Mm. Fine. Um, and, uh, but you know, the, the, the issue is, is that what we're saying, you know, one of the things that I want to focus on is, is really this right to informed consent. And um, in two hours, seeing 200 patients, is a challenge. And negotiating informed consent within that is, is also a, a challenge to medication. And when I say medication, it's like this, okay? So I've had a couple of suicide attempts in my life, and one of them was immediately, you know, with, within, within a week of being put on an antidepressant. Mm. It was amazing. I mean, it was like I was feeling like crap, which is why I was on an antidepressant, and then the next thing you know, I was going to fling myself off a terrace. Um, and, you know, it was now quite well known that it was, apparently it is well known that there is a danger when people are put on certain kinds of antidepressants which can lead to higher rates of suicidal ideation. which is not to say that people should not be put on these medications. But what I'm saying is if I had been given 
that sort of, you know, this could be something that could happen, so let us know. That would have been helpful. There are countless stories of women who have been, um, you know, women who have been put on, on, on psychiatric medication, who have been abandoned by their spouses because uh, they haven't been fulfilling duties of sex. Um, and a lot of, um, a lot of, psychiatric medication sometimes does result in um, low sexual performance and you know unmarried men and women don't get this information sometimes because why do you need it right you're not married um, and uh, I can tell you that I mean I've been put on medication not being told what are the whether I can drink on this medication whether I can you know what, what's the impact on, on my sex drive etc but we know this from the research that we've done that this is not information that's that is often spoken of also because, you know, when mental illness is, you know, you go with your family, etc., it's really difficult to have these discussions. Um, on the point of institutionalization, one is that, you know, the district mental health program is, um, there have been cuts. Uh, it doesn't have the money that it needs to get implemented anyway. We, we, we've run, you know, my colleagues have done studies on this, looking at it for a while, and even in the revised budget estimates, it's, 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 it's ridiculous, like the cuts, we actually asked, <laughs> we had to tweet to the health minister saying that is this a decimal issue or it's like what, but you know this is, this is what is, 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 is happening. But you know when we're looking at you know the, the institutionalization, people, want, from our research we found that people opted for institutionalization for a variety of reasons and not only or always because it was unmanageable, it's just that if you had to manage it somebody had to quit their job. So your family income goes down. You didn't have any other option. And now, over the last six months, I've been working with groups in Chennai that have sought institutionalization even when they didn't want to because they thought that it could get covered under insurance because outpatient services are not covered, um, which is interesting. Um, but the IRDA has put out a notification, but no one is, 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 is you know, no one's actually, no, no insurance products, have, insurance companies have come up with products on that. Um, but when we look at people with, with, with mental illnesses, and this is the last sort of um, anecdata that I'm putting forth, um, you know, people with mental illnesses, when they go to seek um, other uh, kinds of, of care, it becomes a challenge because there is, and there is plenty of research on this, plenty of, the latest uh, paper that I've read is, is based in Australia and, and New South Wales on um, the approaches of medical professionals to people with mental illness as opposed to other physical illnesses. Um, in, when, when I first moved to Chennai, I think within a year, there was, Vaishnavi, was this, uh, the woman with schizophrenia fell off and was denied 2012, 13, I think. She had schizophrenia, she fell off a terrace. And there was no indication that she had jumped. She go, was taken to the hospital with a broken hip. The hospitals refused to admit her as soon as it was declared that she had a history of schizophrenia. Okay? Because they were like, you have to go to the mental hospital. She has a broken hip. Um, we spoke to people who have been, you know, who, who are in, in community care, in, in, you know, in, in systems, um, who have gone to hospitals with complaints of pain, with complaints of giddiness, etc., which have all been put down to, this is probably, you know, you have a headache because you have depression. Um, you know, and they found it very difficult to have discussions around, no, this is a real symptom. Um, personally, and this is where my personal experience comes in, uh, I was about eight weeks pregnant, and, uh, and this, is, this, is, this is to tie up the, the whole discussion uh, and everything from yesterday. And I was supposed to leave for Geneva the very next day. Uh, and at night, we're sitting down to dinner, and I feel a plop between my legs. And I go to check up, and I'm bleeding. And it's 9.30, we don't know what to do. We go to the nearest hospital, and uh, to the emergency room. And, you know, they're taking my history, etc. And you know what hospitals love to do, right? They'll be like, okay, get registered, because everybody wants you to get registered. So I um, am at this point, I'm like, you, know, I don't, you don't have to register me again. I'm telling my partner because I'm already registered at this hospital. And they pull up my details with my uh, mobile phone uh, number, etc. And the reason why I'm registered at this hospital, and this is 2016. So I'm registered at this hospital in 2012 because that's when I moved from Chennai to 
uh, Bom uh, Bombay to Chennai. And I was under um, psychiatric medication, uh, and my doctor made a reference to this doctor, okay? Um, and uh, who was at this hospital. And I met this doctor, and um, he took me off all the cocktail of medication that I was on, which was a terrible idea in hindsight. But anyway, that's a different story. So anyway, I'm registered at this hospital because I've gone to see this doctor. This is what's pulled up when they click a couple of things. She comes to me, the gynecologist who's been seeing me till this point, and asks me, are you sure you're pregnant? Okay? She's like, are you on any psychiatric medication <laughs> right now <laughs> when you conceived? I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and, you know, she, she, she disappeared. <laughs> like, she just left. <laughs> it was an incredible experience where I was on a different trip altogether at that point, but I was just like, this is, I mean, it was stuff that I read in medical papers, <laughs> But I couldn't really believe that this was happening right in front of me, you know, like it was actually everybody's attitude completely changed. And what was interesting for me was, the, I mean, what, well, not, not interesting, what am I saying? But like I, I went to collect my papers, you know, I collect my papers, I went, I mean, the end of the story is that the, the baby was fine, it was just one of those weird things that happens. Um, and I'm looking at the papers later on, and in bold, and I'm saying bolder than my allergies and anything else, in capital letters, was on antipsychotics till 2012. Mm. And this is part of my medical record now, you know. <laughs> and I'm just like, this isn't even relevant to anything. But, you know, I, I left it at that because, I mean, I'm, I'm too busy fighting other people's battles, right? Um, but anyway, the point is, what I'm trying to say is, I mean, these are all diversions, but what, what I'm saying is that, you know, we, we need to look at the holistic experience of people with mental illnesses, whatever you want to identify yourself as, because if we're looking at it only from the mental health medication model, which is currently even the DMHP, um, I, I think that it has potential to work from what I've seen, and yes, I'm basing it on one field study, but I mean, sue me. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if we're only looking at, at, at really at, at that particular approach, we are, we are missing out. So thank you very much for your time. It's been a privilege to be here. Thank you. I'd like to now call um, our next speaker, um, Reshma Valiapan. Uh, who is a founding director of the Red Door, a movement centered around developing holistic models of living. She is also the protagonist of the documentary A Drop of Sunshine and the author of um, Fallen Standing, My Life as a Schizophrenist. She is an Ashoka and Inc. fellow recognized for her continuing efforts to promote safer spaces and choices through community collaborations. Good morning everyone. I hope you're awake because I'm not. So forgive me if I crack a lot of jokes in between this because I need to wake myself up. It's what I do to keep my mind busy since my mind is a lot more busy than everybody else's. I like to call it noise. It's a term in physics. You have white noise, you have black noise, you have color noise. And that is what I incorporate in my paintings. Because in physics, physics tells you about frequency and vibrations and you can't negate that. You can't negate that we're all sitting here grounded to reality and to a flaw and it's called physics, it's called gravity, right? It just so happens that if I start floating in my mind and I stop talking in this language and I go blah, 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 you're not going to understand me. You're going to say like, you know, she's talking crazy. But I'm just talking in another language you probably don't understand. I could talk in Chinese and you wouldn't understand. Unfortunately, terminologies count, right? Because now you only understand English. So what happens when somebody with schizophrenia or anything else speaks to you in another language, you're not going to understand, you're going to think they're talking shit, they're talking crazy. Please forgive these words that I use. I'm very used to working with kids in the community and I deal with high violence four times a week of my life with 200 of what I like to call are my kauravas. So it's completely high violence. These kids talk about how I'm going to thrash you. They talk about all kinds of stuff. Didi, I'm seeing a ghost. I said, good, go kill your ghost instead instead of thrashing your mom. Unfortunately, these kids, yes, are not in the same privileged spaces as we are. Uh, government calls them the poor community where you need to rush into to implement mental health programs. 
which makes absolutely no sense to me because you are talking about kids who look up and they're like, who the hell are you? And you're probably going to diagnose this kid with ODD just for asking you this question because they don't really care. They don't care who you are. So you can forget mental health with them. That is how they talk to their parents because that's what they've seen for a really long time in their lives. Their very parents engaging in violence either to the husband or to the wife or to the very child themselves. Their psychological makeup is that violent. If you talk to me in an aggressive point of view, I will respond with double the amount of it. And when we've had psychologists come into these schools and try to tell us that, you know, this kid has autism, or this kid has ADHD, or this kid has, you know, ODD, is a sexual deviant, all the teachers in I can say is like, you probably never had sex yourself, so please get out. You're talking about adolescence, you're talking about puberty, and unfortunately in our country that, you know, has just like, you know, started to recognize that, you know, women can even talk about periods. If a child talks about masturbation and menstruation, that's a completely different angle altogether. I mean, honestly, we as adults, we are completely messed up in our heads. I mean, you guys, I look like a kid still. <laughs> but adults are messed up. Adults think that a child doesn't know. But child, children know. They have a sense of knowing that you cannot dismiss. Children who come up to you and do tell you they engage in sexual performances and they come from a community, you need to understand what they come from instead of dissing it as a psychological problem that needs to be treated just because you need a syllabus to complete and the teacher cannot deal with that, so let's diagnose this child. And unfortunately, this is happening in a lot of schools. So there's a huge gap between what we're talking in terms of really mental health programs that are getting implemented because you have a job to do. Or are we talking about education? And where most educators are actually dealing with the mental health of their students on very regular basis. When I speak to students in different colleges or in different schools, I mean, half the time when we're talking about really intimate issues that they're having in their mind and they talk about anxiety, they talk about depression, they talk about paranoia, it goes down to them being able to actually even tell you what their cause is. It's not like they're stupid. They know what their cause is. They had a breakup. We're talking about relationships. And I'm standing here not because of that being my work, I'm standing here because the system has failed people like me for 200 years. So if you're talking about 200 years of failure, then Einstein has obviously said that if you've been doing the same things for a long time and it's not gotten given you any result, you've got to start doing things differently. But those of us who are radical still get called as rebels. We still get called as schizophrenics. Where did that term come from? From your books. I didn't gift that term. I didn't call myself an adjective, you did. In one, in every hundred people, there is a so-called schizophrenic. So I'm being politically incorrect because that's not even, an that's not even a word in it from, from India. I mean, it's a word from the countries that have blonde hair. <laughs> I'm very much Asian. In my head, of course, I've got a lot of delusional parents also. But we're talking about language, right? So you're implementing the language of somebody else. If you're talking about science and you're talking about medical science and you're talking about modern day science, these are still new. You know, mad people like us, we've existed for centuries. We come first. We've existed since before Christ. And then when he came and decided, let's cast the devil into the pig. We've existed for a really long time. Science has just come now. And therefore, I like CRPD because CRPD says nothing about us without us. I come first. Your discussions are about me. And if you talk about me without me in the room, I'm obviously going to feel paranoid. I mean, use some logic, right? <laughs> so I'm talking to you in the same way I talk to my kids, not because I'm trying to put you down or something like that, but it's about this. If people talk about people with mental illness without them being in the room and tell us, you've been talking about you, of course I'm going to feel paranoid. What the hell have you been talking about me about? How will I not feel paranoid? If I start reading up stuff that everybody else is talking about and it means my life and I'm not there to speak about my own life, what has given anybody else that right? We know about patriarchy, we know about patronizing attitudes. We do that with kids, we do that with mad people. We say that you cannot make decisions because you're a child. How do you know about it? 
if you come to my school and you tell the child that I know what your problem is and this is why you didn't do your homework, how do you know what my problem is? And the child is making a statement. And likewise, how do you know what my problem is when you can't even see it? We do not call cancer patients. We say, she, with, she has cancer. She has cancer. She's lived with cancer. She's not canceric. When people with high illnesses like cancer or brain tumors or heart diseases or even diabetes, the same argument that has been used to compare mental illnesses with all of this, we tell them, change your lifestyle. Change your food habits. Don't take so much of stress. Please talk to your husband or wife or your children and get them, you know, as part of your treatment plans. We are so compassionate with them. But no, not to me. Compassion does not exist in mental health. This is the truth. We can pretend because that's what Carl Gustav Jung told us to do, right? Put on these different masks and call them archetypes. But it's not gotten us anywhere. It's not actually given you functioning schizophrenics. So my question is, where are your functioning schizophrenics? I've been into advocacy since 2004. I've been seeing psychiatrists since, since 1995. I was 15 then. You can do the math and figure out how old I am. I'm actually 600. And I've been seeing psychiatrists since, since age 15. I saw another one in 2001. I saw another one in 2002. Finally, after all that window shopping that my parents couldn't figure out what is wrong with their daughter who's completely a rebellious kid, who takes on like a little bit of the father's DNA, because that's the logic, of course, they eventually realize it's paranoid schizophrenia. But thankfully, I get to a psychiatrist who is human enough to understand that Reshma is just a different type of a person. I mean, separate her paranoia and she's still this aggressive thing because she's just like her father. I mean, his books didn't have to teach him that. He is a father to a 16-year-old. He got it. That is what I think a psychiatrist should be. The ability to actually see beyond that label, to, to see us as human beings. And then we form a bond with them. We form a rapport with them. And it came to a point where I wanted him to be my guardian and not my parents anymore. And I said, no, you please come and you, you sit in that hospital room with me. He said, I can't. I'm your psychiatrist. I said, can't you just like pretend? So there are this group of individuals. Unfortunately, three of them that I know on my fingertips don't wish to be named. Because when my psychiatrist came out, even in the movies, calling psychiatry a vending machine, I'm pretty sure you can imagine what the rest of the people thought of him. I mean, in his own profession. So when Amba talks about a movement, there's a reason a movement exists. A movement is not about, even if you look at art movements and literally movements, it's about making a standpoint about those who are actually affected by the system. A movement is talking about the politics. It's not talking about anything else before that. It is talking about the politics and the history of how something has begun and therefore it's called a movement. Because then the artist comes and tells you about it or the crazy person comes and tells you about it. Right? So we need to bear in mind there is a politics, there are so much of politics involved, which is why we are speaking in a law college. Law is connected to politics. And we all know that. Mental health policy programs are about, yes, implementing. It's great to implement the policies. It's great to implement programs. It's great to implement it in one of what is going to be large, the largest population on Earth soon. In, by 2030, we are going to take over China. We are not going to have enough ratios of psychiatrists and doctors and mental health practitioners to your regular folks. These regular folks are not you and me with blonde hair or white hair. I have passed the age group of 35. I'm no more in the youth. This group of individuals that we are thinking about consist of those below 35, those below 30, and those below 18. And what we are trying to tell them is, if a child is getting restless in school, you have ADHD. If a child is talking about imaginary friends and ghosts, you must be having schizophrenia. Because if you are talking about functioning, in terms of the same understanding that we were trying to say that, okay, if I'm having this so-called symptom, but I can yet function and go on my day-to-day -day lives, it is okay. I don't really have to take medications, etc. But how do we tell this to a child? Because, you know, children, they refuse to function. 
they don't want to function. Your lectures are boring, your teaching is boring. So even if he is talking about a ghost, for the next eight hours in school, he refuses to function. He's going to thrash somebody else out just because somebody called him names, not because the ghost told him for it. How are we looking at the context of then what illnesses are in India compared to what it is outside of India? I've been without medication since 2008. Psychiatrists honestly don't like me. I don't know why. Maybe I've taken away the business, but I've offered my psychiatrist another business model. And it works. We are talking about creating change. You have to be a change maker. I cannot be a patient of schizophrenia, neither can my psychiatrist be an acting doctor. We both have to work together on being change makers, which forces us to challenge everything we know about even each other and ourselves. And by doing that, then we are able to work on actually f looking at people differently before you even think of looking at them as disorders. Because medications have never worked for someone like me. I've been on 14 medications a day with the same symptoms and side effects Amba has been talking about, plus another more. Sleeping for 18 hours a day. If that is life, I'd rather be dead. So if I decide to commit myself to suicide, don't call it a zit disorder. It comes as a secondary condition for me. And my psychiatrist did have to make a difficult decision when I had to go out of medications. Now, many of us choose medications, many of us don't, but do we have the choice? No. That's a different thing. Can we reach an understanding with you? Yes, if you learn to speak our language. Like you cannot use large sentences when you're talking to a six-year-old kid. You can't go and tell him about the fundamental concepts in psychology. It's like, huh? I don't know what you're saying. And he's going to get distracted and he's going to run away. You're not going to say that he's, he can't understand you. You're going to make a point to speak in the language that he will understand you in. So my question is, why do we not speak in the same language to who you're calling as the mad people? Because there are many of us in the world, many of us who have been part of the movement, and now we're here, but you're not there. So we've made it a point to understand your reality and your worlds, but you, I don't know if you've made it a point to understand ours. And that's very unfair. That is very, very unfair. Because it's my life in your hands, not yours in mine. And you are also going to be responsible for all of these other children we are talking about. There is a user survivor from Russia who has said that we are really scared that soon there will not be enough, there will be no children in Russia left because they're all being sent to institutions. They're not psychiatric institutions, they're institutions. I've been in tough love camps, you've never heard them in India, but I've been sent to them. I mean, I was born and brought up in Malaysia. I've been to tough love camps. I know what a behavioral psychologist does to you. I've been in psychotherapist cabin. I mean, more than me, they are more interested in my sexual fantasies. So you're interested in my sexual fantasies, but when I engage you, it's a, it's a symptom. Right. Maybe by engaging it with you, it might not be a symptom. So we need to understand what is really then happening. How are practitioners then working? What is the trust we are giving to each other or to the person who has trusted their lives and minds in your hand? If I trust my psychiatrist, I trust him completely because it's not the body I'm trusting him with. There are many of us, we go beyond our bodies. Many of us have had trauma that might shock everybody else. But if my mind is in somebody else's hand, I've given you something that even God doesn't have, if there's such a thing as God. And it is a responsible situation. It is the most responsible position for somebody to be in. So if they decide to even slightly play around with that responsibility, you lose what is a very important thing called trust and rapport. And we stop believing every other person out there. And these are stories, not just of mine, but a lot of people in our peer support group, we talk about them. When we're talking about community change, community change is possible. There are several Ashoka fellows who are also user survivors, scattered around India, who are working in communities, dealing with high spectrum disorders, such as schizophrenia, borderline personality disorders, bipolar disorder. And they are doing some excellent work. 
But because we are living in a country as large as, of, large as ours, yes, it's difficult to gather so many people. It's difficult to find out research. It's, it's difficult to gather this data and figure out who's doing what. But we can't be such close-minded people. We need to be open-minded. Of course, don't be so open-minded. You might get schizophrenia like me. Or maybe you should. <laughs> then I won't feel so left out in life. So please look up many of these other individuals who have been doing some substantial work at the community levels with other practitioners. And they, what, we come, what we believe in is that there are many factors to what causes mental illness. There are many groups, of course. That is what academia is. That is what science is. Everybody's going to be debating with each other. And you know that's what it is, right? We have different theories. We have different ideas. And it's true for each and every one of us. That one will say it's a genetic disorder. That's also true. One will say it's a chemical imbalance. It's true for that person. One will say it's you know, caused by this. It's true for this dude. You know, One will say it's caused by some devil possession. It's true for that guy who sits and does chanting. Everybody has the idea of what has caused it. And we're saying it's true. But ask the person who is experiencing it, what do you think has caused it? Because it is about you. So we can take all of the other people who we say have the authority to decide on what has caused it fair enough. But it is important to also ask the person, what do you think has caused yours? And I've seen my psychiatrist do that with me. He was trying to have a conversation. How many of us have dialogues within our own spaces and families? We don't. We have lost out on them. We don't have dialogues. We don't have conversations with people. We want to tell them, I'm right. We don't listen just for the sake of listening. We listen because we want to respond and reply. So I listen. I hear voices. I have no choice. I cannot reply to my voices. I cannot fight with my voices. If I do that, they're just going to get the better of me. So you know what? I just choose to listen. I am not to reinforce something Bollywood is trying to tell me, but I just listen. It makes me an extremely good listener, because sometimes I even listen to people when they're not talking. When you have a child in front of you who refuses to talk, you have to listen. You have to listen to the body language, the eyes, what the child is doing. The child is engaging in different things. And these are all cues. These are all signs of how the child is communicating to you. Do we do that? We don't do that, even with each other. We, we expect people to talk like this. You must speak in a language that I understand you and vice versa, right? If I don't speak in a language, you will not understand what I'm saying. Decide, I just decide to keep quiet and make faces at you. If I had makeup on, you'll think it's an amazing mime act. But if I just kept doing this throughout, you're going to eventually say that you're, I'm wasting your time and I'm talking shit. We easily do this. Now, I'm only specifically talking about children because my life now has gone. It's pointless. I can only give you the experience or the understanding of it from what has happened to it. I cannot so much do anything about changing my past, or for those of us who have been in it for a really long time. But if we are responsible human beings in a country that has the largest population of youth, we have to start being responsible human beings in recognizing that each one of us exists differently and think differently. And our youth in India we are completely messed up compared to even Chinese. And that's very true. because. Our youth, our youngsters, are existing in per square kilometers also. And each one of them are influenced also by the American dream and also by the Indian dream. And then you need to also get married, like what your mom and papa tell you. Go to college, get educated, but no, you must marry somebody from our caste. Even if I send you to US, you must find somebody from our caste. It sounds like something that is easy for a child to deal with, but it is not. The pressures. I can't even think about it. I am wondering how do even law students sit for five years in one place? I'm like, I can't even sit 20 minutes in one place. Five years, really? I mean, I'm bored. I mean, five years, in four years, I did two masters already. I mean, I mean, how do you guys function at just one intellectual you know, space? It's, it's unimaginable, but it's pressure. And that pressure comes with a lot of other things comes with girlfriends, boyfriends, parents, you know, suddenly it's like father's calling you up. It happened in front of me yesterday. Father's calling her up while she's having a walk with me. Are you studying? And she probably just wants to walk 
because she knows like you know after three years she has to go back and get married no south indian has to go and get married does she want to get married no she wants to pursue her career is she going undergoing anxiety and depression yes are you going to call it a disorder or response to a lot of factors around her now if she chooses to take her medications that's for her to decide because it will help her if she doesn't choose to take medications you must then offer her an alternate so we were saying holistic approaches the idea is to look at have a conversation ask the person ask the person ask the person we don't ask we assume and there are all of these other concepts that do work or not concepts anymore but they have been in practice at the ground level for about 10 years or even more in many other organizations mine has just been for 7 years right now i'm undergoing a 7 year itch you know like a marriage to the communities but we have seen how creativity works we have seen how expression of many things works if this could involve maybe things that you might might not be in your idea or your perspective you might not think it is workable you might not think uh, it's something doable like if i were to say that you know practice mime or do art or do painting or do writing or you know reiki or ayurveda or homeopathy or whatever even if it means taking a punching bag now there are many things that will not favor you and many things will not favor me just like i don't understand your law at uh, many different levels so i'm going to obviously crack a joke about it <laughs> right and vice versa if you don't understand you know my background of my studies you will also find a reason to kind of diss it it's human nature that we do it but i think we can be open we can still be open and we can tell people that these are your options there are many many options to also ask them that do you want that many options is letting them know that i respect where you're coming from you have the ability to decide and i'm here for whatever you want to decide and that works right because i'm basically trying to say is don't disempower the person by boxing it under just one thing when you give them possibilities of something being something else you're offering them an ability to look at their conditions from oh maybe this is what it is so i'm just going to end this with something that um kind of connects to my last sentence was when i was on a panel in another college and um a very well known uh, dancer uh, she was a daughter she's a daughter of uh, one of the late bollywood actresses and she came up to me when she heard me talk and she said that one of her students came to her crying saying that she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and she said that she knows what her disorder is about it's incurable you know she has to take the medications for life and stuff and now the teacher right the dance teacher didn't know what to do with her she said i don't know how to help you because i don't know what this bipolar disorder is now this girl could not describe what the bipolar disorder was like what was her condition and every time she tried to ask her what it was she said no you i have to just take my medications and wait it's you know it's a disorder it's that's what it is and i just told her that basically means we don't know if there's hope if i have to wait i don't know what my hope is if you just tell me it's a disorder i don't know because when we read stuff a lot of us now have google right google will tell us it's a disorder there is no hope take your damn medications wait for it do you think we are patient enough to wait for it no we won't so that itself will start killing us that loss of hope the lack of ability to think that i have control over what is happening over me that's a worse space to be in and all i said you're her teacher just ask her what do you think she has then i mean it's just a dialogue you're not telling her don't take your medications and don't go see the psychiatrist go see the psychiatrist you believe in him you know but also try and figure out what is it that you think is happening to you when you ask a person these questions automatically they feel that oh yeah you know this happened that happened they will start telling you like a lot of other stories that have happened and just by working with them on the, in these stories of maybe a breakup a death of a you know a family or a loved one or maybe guilt that has been bottling up inside them it makes them feel they have control on their disorder and that really becomes the first step of how 
change actually happens even just at a personal level by merely having conversations. So I'm just going to leave you with this because I might see things that are not there, but I don't know if you see things that are even there. Thank you, Reshma. Uh, we will now have uh, Vaishnavi Jaikumar um, as the final speaker for this panel. And to introduce her, she is a co-founder of the Banyan, an NGO in Chennai, which enables access to health, both physical and mental, for persons living in poverty and homelessness. In her capacity as a disability rights activist, she has lectured at various uh, institutions. Her perspectives and insights are informed by her experiences as a user survivor, having lived with clinical depression, um, um, as well as having been a caregiver, a mental health professional, and a rights advocate. Before uh, we start, I just have to, I have to make this observation that, um, you know, it's, I was telling, where did she go? Okay, I think Dr. Jen's left, but, you know, there was this concept of manals where you have, you know, all men panels. Um, and it's interesting that, I mean, of course, there were, they, we used to have this concept where often you wouldn't have panels talking about mental illness without user survivors. But it's interesting that the user survivors are women and the professionals are men. Mm -hmm. It's just something that I found a little interesting uh, based on Dr. Jain's talk yesterday on what our perceptions of care um, and stuff is. Okay, apologies. Um, I don't know how to reduce the page settings on Google Slides. So uh, some of it went a little awry, so I'm just taking it from the online presentation. Um, so, yeah, I'll just stick to that. Yeah. That should be fine. Yeah. So uh, this is what I'm going to be speaking about. Uh, consciously chose to go last because I knew a lot of what I wanted to cover would be covered by uh, others. Um, so yes, this is my topic. And uh, um, it's policy and status. Hey, Amba, I need to read from that. <laughs> Just put settings. 
through services and close it again. Yeah. Yeah. Shut down everything. Just give me one more minute. Yeah. So it's basically policy and status um, uh, ending a hundred years of lassitude. Um, there's a reason why I've chosen the picture over there. Yeah, how do we evolve uh, essentially our mental health policy, uh, which has, to a very large extent, uh, stayed uh, more or less stagnant. Yeah, stayed more or less stagnant for. If you go to the next slide, yeah. Now, there's a reason why I've chosen the theme of evolution and stasis in evolution. You do know, like, for example, the whole theory of Gondwana and, and how, uh, you know, the continents broke up and uh, some, some fragments stayed more or less uh, the same, uh, whereas uh, as far as species go and uh, others evolved at a different rate. Now, this is not an exact comparison, but the concept of stasis is a picture that I showed initially that fish is the coelacinth. It's actually an example of a fossil, something that hasn't really uh, not talking millennia as far as mental health in India goes, talking more about um, uh, a century at least and yeah. Um, and, and why I would like to compare this with the United Kingdom is because there was a common point, just like we had Gondwana land which fragmented into, uh, you know, Africa, Madagascar, uh, India, and various other um, parts. Uh, we have UK and India more or less at the same starting point. With the United Kingdom's Lunacy Act in 1890, followed by the Indian Lunacy Act in around 1912. Yeah. So, uh, contrary to what... Um, most bashing happens nowadays as far as the it was as far as that age goes a pretty comprehensive and progressive for that time uh, piece of legislation in fact this particular iteration of the lunacy act in uh, uk is kind of hailed and the indian lunacy act in fact uh, there's an anecdote of madras you know kind of uh, talking about the need for uh, voluntary admissions of people who have mental health problems. But essentially, it's all about you have a duty to provide care mentally. And this is how you should do it. And these are the processes by which this thing needs to be done. Now, let's take a giant leap to India post-independence. Um, similarly with the United Kingdom, there's a lot that has happened there, but I'm choosing only the uh, highlights. There is nothing that has happened over here. There's, you know, maybe a committee report over here or a minor amendment over there, but essentially that has stagnated. Now we move to the 1959 Mental Health Act in UK, and in India we have the 1987 Mental Health Act, which is, perhaps you could say it's evolved a bit, um, but is still very rooted in its history as, you know, the successor to the Indian Lunacy Act. Except that, uh, and there we've, we've stayed there till 2017, which is when um, the Mental Health Act finally was passed and came into, was notified. And um, mind you, the entire process for this whole policy and act and things like that, uh, was from 2012. So I'm talking about, yeah, 1912 to 2012 as far as mental health policy goes. Now in, in, in UK instead, you have 
Um, in addition to all of this, it's not like each one replaced the other one. Uh, you had a Mental Capacity Act, okay? And between 2005 and 2009, you had, uh, okay, the next one, Sigma, is actually the Scottish uh, um, impaired uh, um, decision-making ability, but only, you know, for people with mental health issues, so it kind of distinguished between, um, you know, people who were literally almost not there, a little bit like you could say um, uh, Aruna Shanbag, versus people who had some uh, decision-making ability. So there itself, all the grays and this distinction between I have capacity, don't have capacity, uh, I uh, am able or incapable, all those distinctions had started kind of coming out. And mind you, 2005 was still very much in the pre-UNCRPD uh, time, but probably the pre uh, CRPD influence is seen in this. Yeah, and you also have uh, the Office of Public Opinion, which was, uh, which recognized that something which I find nowadays uh, uh, in our to move from one system to another, or rather force a system to move from an institution-based system to a, a, commo a more community living uh, system, we tend to forget that a community does not have to necessarily be caring. And we forget that there are people without families. Uh, in which case, then who cares? Ultimately, there needs to be some, however patriarchal, however um, dated that entire concept is, when there is nobody for someone, who cares? And whom do we address that to? So that concept of oversight was, is really essential, and that is taken and scrutinized by the Office of the Public Guardian in UK. 2009, you had uh, amendments which brought in uh, the deprivation of liberty safeguards. Uh, that was an amendment to the Mental Capacity Act and which addressed the individual's rights within this entire framework of mental capacity. And uh, it is, in fact, right now uh, there is a bill uh, in UK which is going to be doing away with it and uh, changing it and calling it uh, uh, something else like a uh, safeguard. Um, so that, in fact, is still evolving. There have been, there've been problems with this. I mean, the fact that you have to have a deprivation of liberty safeguard itself is admission of a problem, an intrinsic problem. Um, 2009, again, something that acknowledges that the world moving from tuition based to a more equitable uh, based setup, no more exile up people in a ship of fools uh, commission so something I am a huge fan of because this isn't restricted to illness. This isn't re restricted to people who have uh, for like a home for uh, uh, so or, uh, uh, even let's say an old age home people without any problems whatsoever uh, orphanages uh, women in distress any it it acknowledges that, unlike India, that where you have a center, especially a residential center, or wherever, more accurately, there is an imbalance of power, you will have abuse. And the question is, what do we do about that abuse? And they've chosen to have one commission. Now, the commission also goofs. You'll still find, uh, you know, uh, horror stories about children with autism getting whacked, uh, other people being teased. Uh, but it exists, and it's one, one for everything. I'm a big fan of one for everything. Um, yeah. 
And then you have the 2010 Equality Act, which is an equality and non-discrimination umbrella act, again, for everyone. Doesn't matter whether it's a question of being HIV positive, whether somebody called you uh, the R word, um, whether you're a woman, whether you're a different uh, a race, ethnic minority, it doesn't, all of that comes under what they call protected characteristics. We could learn a thing or two from this because if you take the concept of protected characteristics as far as the discrimination and the disability is not there in only a fixed number. And this system of uh, allowing for any group which is facing abuse or discrimination of any kind is, I would say, the way to go. Unfortunately, if you look at the India side of things, so this you can see evolution. Over here, from let's say there till 2012, which is when they formed the policy group, there's been nothing, really. I mean, we may have a law with a few changes here and there. What it is translating to on the ground is nothing much. Next. Yeah. So when you're talking about the justice and um, ground realities as far as people with mental illness are concerned, it's almost like reading like the history of PIL in India. And that's something I will come to again last. Essentially, it is, yeah, it started off with um, uh, Veena Sethi and um, Sheila Barse, and um, that was mostly to do with prisons and mental illness. One more on uh, prisoners who were mentally ill, and another was on people who had no business being in prisons in the first place, but who were admitted there nevertheless. So they were criminal, so as it says, non-criminal lunatics. Um, yeah. Um, now that was followed by 2001, which in Irwadi happened, and uh, because uh, 25 people died, 26 maybe, um, and because it was a huge issue and the world's spotlight was on India and mental health, uh, the Supreme Court took on this entire issue suomoto. That is my biggest grievance with the Supreme Court because, yes, they took this up in 2001. Uh, all the states were, you know, forced to give affidavits of what the status was in each of their states, how many unlicensed places, how many hospitals, how many psychiatrists. Is that the usual stuff which should have been available anywhere, should have been even now, but it, is, it isn't, if you do an RTI for any kind of mental health stats, yeah, if you do an RTI for any kind of mental health stats, they will dig out the 2001, um, you know, kind of uh, affidavits that they sent, and they will just give you that. Okay? So, um, in uh, less than, I think, a year after that, they came out with an order which was controversial because it was, um, again, pre-CRPD uh, and this entire seismic change happening as far as uh, the face of disability and mental health went. Uh, and that, in fact, mandated a district hospital in every district mental hospital in each district. Now, in defense of what the Supreme Court was thinking, I mean, everybody found that outrageous psychiatrists, uh, mental health professionals, uh, user survivors, everyone. But I think in defense of the Supreme Court, we need to think of it as, forget about the mode in which it is happening. If you're really talking about access to services in districts, so let's look at it like that. Um, which, yes, the DMHP is supposed to be functioning, but which really, I mean, we're talking about DMHP starting 1980s, uh, coming really into, the Bellari model 1992, um, and
and you know thereafter it, it was a very slow uptake and really speaking as the one or two studies which were done on how the DMHP was functioning very little happening in some states it's good in some states it's non-existent and the worst part of it is in some states it's done as long as the center is giving you money but the DMHP which was being funded by centers gov uh, central government money which the plan is very clear you're supposed to take on after three years five years whenever was never done case in point Rajasthan yeah so then we come to uh, uh, illegal detention yeah so what uh, happened to the air that was another case of going to sleep like Ripa and Winkle and uh, after this uh, controversial order happened which nobody acted on uh, and then even the hearings in the Supreme Court kind of came to a halt because CRPD it was argued that you know I mean um, this whole new lens of looking at things is coming along with the CRPD and India is going to be ratifying it etc etc so can you please stall on doing anything else um, so that we can have a more harmonized thing except that it stalled then and nothing happened I mean maybe they met once a year once in two years it was just adjourned and really uh, until the Airwadi case kind of, kind of petered out really uh, I think it was a couple of years back maybe 2016 where literally the Supreme Court which had started off this whole effort to a motto basically said okay fine if nobody else has any complaints then let's just shut it okay yeah in the meantime there have been cases of uh, uh, illegal detention 2008 2018 um, another case again in Delhi I forget the name uh, Natalis was in fact uh, part of the zealous uh, efforts by the state in especially in Tamil Nadu um, this was a person who is uh, Dutch, I think, and he, uh, you see, the collector of Kodekanal at that point of time was very proactive, and she um, uh, very controversially uh, rounded up um, 100 people who seemed to be mentally ill on the streets of Kodekanal, and um, it was like a workshop assembly kind of thing. I mean, part of me is like in genuine admiration, uh, but guessing people there's more like a record and uh, it's cleaning up the streets and uh, various other human rights violations but uh, defense she did have so um, part of the assembly line was like everybody is given the uh, new clothes and then a psychiatrist one psychiatrist who went through the whole bunch and then because there's no facility sent them to I Dilpok in Chennai was aghast because I mean they had well enough people of their own uh, looking at the crowd of 1500 suddenly a busload of people is coming all the way from Kodekanal in fact at that point I remember there was a lot of very uh, jingoistic thought you know I mean why are these all these are people from different states of India why are we uh, you know being Nadu alone bearing the brunt of uh, you know we should send them back etc etc so one of the people who was scooped up in that effort was uh, Nathali's father and I'm assuming he was maybe he did have a mental health problem I mean if you're just roaming around in the streets of uh, Kodaikanal when you can do other things uh, and you're in bad shape which he was um, maybe he did have something but then he landed up in IMH in which again it's very typical whether you're in a police station or hospital or a mental hospital. Mental hospital is worse because you're just marooned there. But there's a problem of language. And that's something which we have not managed to fix as yet as far as our systems go. So uh, he was just lost over there and keeping to himself. And then his daughter finally traced him down. And uh, there was a PIL. And uh, I think just, uh, Justice Prabhashi, they even gave... Uh, the government, mental hospital, Gwadaikanal collector, a real dressing down. And, you know, that's a pretty good case to refer to if you're looking at 
uh, assumptions about people with mental health problems or potentially mental uh, potential mental health problems and as far as illegal detention goes uh, the other case of mr ravinder is again something which keeps happening and which despite the fact that the judiciary is batting for mental health in india largely uh, you also have cases like i remember uh, one justice um, were angry because a woman who was arguing her own case got so frustrated at the pace at which things were happening that she stripped now i could argue that you know removing clothes and stripping is is a sign test um and that's been used so effectively right from uh, an uh, the <laughs> the judge kind of got angry and said that only a person who is mentally ill will do such a thing and sent her off to ibhas i don't know what happened to her but what happened in the case of mr ravinder is a pretty similar situation in which he lost his temper at the motor accidents compensation tribunal and uh, he just blew now if i take one of you randomly i put you in a vehicle and i go and leave you in the mental hospital without telling you anything or if i just say that okay i think the way in which you are behaving is like a quote and god mad person so come and i will put you in there and it's for your own good how would most of you react you react with anger right especially if you're a woman and if you react angrily it's dead clear you have a mental health problem that's why you're talking like this otherwise women will not talk like this so that's probably what happened with the earlier lady but in his case it was the same thing and he was put and his family could not even contact him for at least 3 or 4 days uh, so his son went to court and justice murlidhar of the delhi high court uh, gained the ire of uh, quite a few uh, people in the psychiatric community um, but essentially i think all he did was he just quoted the mental health act of 1987 and correlated to each of the mistakes that had been made uh, he did the same thing in the case of another girl who was admitted by her parents not a girl a woman, young woman who was admitted by her parents um, and in fact the parents had to pay a fine um, Yeah. So those are the two things on illegal uh, detention. Then we have, um, yeah, the UP um, PIL. If you notice there's suddenly a lot of talk happening about uh, getting people out of the mental hospitals, going into long-stay homes, um, you know, living in the community, community tie-ups with NGOs, that kind of thing. All of that is no thanks to any disability activist. no thanks to any mental health human rights nothing okay all we do is we sit and yap in conferences like this all of that is due to one lawyer who on his own filed a pil uh, after getting and uh, doing an rti on the number of people who were just stagnating in mental hospitals despite quote and quote having been cured they no longer needed to be there but because let's say nobody had managed to trace their families uh, the assumption was the family won't want them back and they're there so at one point of time at least 20 to 30% of hospital occupancy is being taken up by people who are living there and they don't need to so that is responsible and you can in fact slowly see each state is you know kind of uh, having to do partnerships with ngos and these kind of situations ngos are always very useful otherwise everybody can bitch about them being corrupt and various other things uh, earlier in fact i think there was a similar thing for people uh, who were violent uh, who were kind of admitted and probably uh, violent mentally ill criminals okay that's a mouthful and not the best way of putting it but again um, they wanted them out of the prison system so then again the supreme court said ngos to the rescue please come i don't know what happened to that but here because uh, maybe of the non criminal uh, um, 
uh, non-criminal uh, facet of things and because times have also changed uh, yeah something is happening people are being pushed out now um, cut to 2019 18 19 i would say uh, the end of december uh, the same lawyer gaurav bansal um, filed a pil on uh, people who with mental now this is not just people with mental illness it could be a person who is mentally uh, intellectually disabled anyone basically it's a kind of chained because the family is scared that the person will wander away and fall into a manhole or uh, just wander away and get lost okay uh, and also none there are no facilities where they are so i'm with the parents on this thing maybe chaining is not the best way i still have in fact a case of a person in west bengal who is chained because she has an attraction towards water or so the reporter reports um, and therefore she's been chained now for i don't know more than 10 years she's young imagine 10 years of your life just being chained because the family cannot spare the time because they can't afford it to constantly be there so she's chained because otherwise she will land up and she doesn't know how to swim we're still trying to trace the family um, with not much luck yeah so if you look i mean two huge events mentally ill in prisons by the way if you look at the latest uh, national crime records uh, bureau uh, the prison statistics you will find heck of a lot of people with uh, uh, mental illness so still stuck in prisons uh, there have been uh, delhi high court uh, uh, a pil about you know person who had uh, attempted to kill herself um, but fa failed so to speak and uh, landed up over there and i mean what would you do putting a person who is suicidal in a prison she is naturally going to want to finish off what she started and there was nothing there's no counseling why the person with the you know uh, this particular section this was before the 2017 um, mental health care act came into uh, which has kind of decriminalized uh, suicide but not entirely um so prisons still happening you will still find people who shouldn't be there who should either be getting some kind of treatment or should be you know discharged or whatever uh, then we come to airwadi and which was supposed to be a complete overhaul of the system and which didn't now we come to 2019 the trigger for this was the you may have read about the faith healing centers in badaun in up uh, it was badly misreported i think there must have been around 20 to 27 it was reported as hundreds of uh, people have been chained uh, faith healing thing and uh, so therefore we have come full circle again with the supreme court people being chained in a faith healing center um, and a court intervention to try and do something about it next so the previous thing was basically uh, one of the things which happened as a result of um, airwadi and the crpd and all of that is that there is a bit of a dichotomy as far as you know the whole human rights aspect of mental health and the on the ground treatment of uh, a mental health emergency uh, and that is sad because we are now no longer able to sit at a table and talk really and try and work together there are like too many egos there's too much of ideological difference and at the end of the day there are people who are bearing the brunt of this inability to work together so that's what the earlier thing about airwadi and the decision making crisis was about yeah so now we come to uh, what do we do now this is where we are now here and now what can we do now this is all just me okay so uh, this is my opinion yeah i had an argument recently with uh, 
uh, psychiatrist friend, uh, I was fixated. And for me, data is important. Information is very important. And I believe that the best way of closing an institution is to open it up. Not open more necessarily, but open it up so that there is a culture in which you don't have just one visitors committee, which God knows if it meets or not, but is more open to community-based monitoring and to a more transparent way of functioning. Like, nobody knows what the state mental health authorities are doing. I mean, even if you try asking, you will get, you'll get blown off. Uh, so, and uh, even mental hospitals, it's not easy to just go there. You'll be suspected of all kinds of uh, nefarious things, sometimes uh, uh, <laughs> with, with uh, reason. But otherwise, they don't want you there. I mean, because then you're a nuisance, you're a bother, and you'll come and you'll find fault with the system, and you don't know the problems that we're facing. The central government has not released our funds for uh, three years, and we are functioning deficit and blah, 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 and we don't have people, etc. So, yeah, so where does it leave us today? Now, I'm taking off from the whole Badaun uh, incident, which has come almost uh, two decades after Irwadi. And I just have questions. My questions are, if you are having a DMHP program, and I know, OK, let's not call it DMHP because okay, it's not functioning, it's not worked for so long, whatever. If you're having a community-based uh, model and you are trialing it in certain districts, why would you not just go where your population is? Your target population naturally congregates in a variety of faith, faith healing points. Okay, This is a map that I created uh, of all the faith healing centers which have been reported. There could be more. In fact, I'd ask for people to uh, add to that if possible. Uh, actually, from here onwards, you can make it uh, large, view present, whatnot. So um, would you not go there? I mean, and th that's where the whole uh, model of what uh, Milesh Hamlai tried in uh, Ahmedabad, which uh, Gunasilan tried by itself in Trichy, uh, and which now Airwadi has, the Hagdar committee has tied up with the government, and they're running a kind of center out of Airwadi. Do it however you call it. You're going where the people are. And people are naturally going to faith healing centers. Would you not choose your DMHP districts or whatever you call it districts based on where these places are? I mean, that's easy, right? What people call low fruit, low hanging fruit kind of thing. And, and somehow accept that people have different ways of uh, believing that they will get, if not cured, better. And Except that maybe, you know, not everybody has faith in a medical-based treatment. It basically means offering more than one way, offering a variety and a more democratic way of decisions and deciding. Uh, so my one point is, if you have these things, why aren't you doing more of your Dr. Dawa Dua models in each of these places? It may be even fact getting institutionalized in uh, some places, like in Airwadi now, it's like the nurse tells the person, have you gone? Have you finished praying? Have you finished meditating? Go do that first and then come over here for a week. It's, it's reached that, situation, that state. But still, you're offering both. And that's essential. Next. OK, this is a blurred slide from my 12th uh, five-year plan submission. Essentially, what this is, is um, I think, yeah. I think the green ones are where uh, the DMHP is actually being implemented, and all the orange ones are the prevalence according to the census figures. And as you can see, it doesn't really make much sense. Okay, again, a, a little bit of blur as for the lights. Anyway, so essentially, what this is, I myself closer. Yeah, wait, hang on. Yeah. Uh, so this points out 
this again was prior to the 12 fire plan, so it's like 100 crores of NMHP, DMHP funds were unutilized from 2000, 2010. Okay. Next. Yeah. Okay. Now, the previous slide, I think, um, okay, this one shows uh, the pathetic state. In fact, the heading talks about WHO Mental Health Atlas and went back, which came out last year. Um, and this has, in fact, the number of people who are actually working in the government. And for me, that's very important because when you talk public health, it is not privatizing public health. Public health. It is not, I mean, India really needs to invest in public health, not just mental health, but, uh, and that's another entire topic. But here you have, so uh, the whole WHO angle is that nobody knows how many psychiatrists there are in India. Um, not Medical Council of India, because you know they have members, people have gone abroad, some people have died. So the constant figure that you'll keep hearing, there are 4,500 psychiatrists in India. And the reality is uh, something like 20 years later, it's still more or less the same, uh, except that these are the number of people who are actually working in the government and who are employed by the government, and that is not too old a figure, 2015. This was a question asked in Parliament. So, how many psychiatrists are there? Amba? Thousand something. Yeah. Essentially, it's around 1,600, 1,700 psychiatrists who are actually working in the government sector. Next. Yeah, in which case, if you remember, the DMHP uh, was overhauled around 2011 or so. Um, and it was like DMHP version 2 and a huge component of that was um, investing in getting more mental health professionals. Uh, so money was given to various centers of excellence to generate human resources um, except that at the end of the day we still have the same number and all these seats 625 seats. Now, if from 2011, we've been churning out, uh, you know, even half, we should be having at least, what, 300, 400 more psychiatrists, out of which even if you take one in four uh, lands up somehow in government uh, service, where are all these people? That, that, that whole figure is remaining static. So what's the point then of making that part of your DMHP if they're just going to be generating psychiatrists who will go and land and work up in the NHS in the UK. Next. Finally, like I said, what is the figure? 100 or 300 crores in, um, uh, were wasted in that entire decade, 2000 to 2010, 300 uh, crores. So this, for example, is when we work on budgets, and some of us are really interested in doing that because we firmly believe, uh, despite the uh, tragedy of the so-called health plan, uh, we notice that, I mean, we just focus on how much have we got. This is what we've got, and that's the budgeted expense. Except that some of these ministries, social justice is particularly bad in this, and health is selectively bad. So you'll find only two badly performing as far as expenses go uh, in uh, the health department and DMHV mental health NM is one. So if you notice over here, what has it been reduced to, Amba? Huh. Yeah, the figure. No, probably not. But, uh, okay, sorry, I have to look very closely. Yeah, 43.5 uh, crores. Uh, the budget, yeah, so this was for 2017-18. This was your actual, okay? Budgeted 50, fair enough. It's not really 10%. Look at what they did. How much is that? 5.5. They slashed it to 5.5 crores. Why? 
The reason why is it really depends on how efficiently you're spending your money. And if your ministry is doing a bad job of that, and another ministry is just going full steam ahead in spending, then this is what you get. They take your money and they give it elsewhere. We call your revised estimate. It happens around uh, October or so. Something to watch out for as far as your various sectors go. Next. Yeah. So if we really look at, uh, in fact, I created a moment on this whole Badaun case and this one person called Alim, uh, who was left. Yeah, huh? done. Okay. Yeah, I'm winding up. Yeah, so uh, in the thread that I've linked to, it's interesting about how exactly um, there are a variety of opinions, and everybody's more or less saying the right thing. The family is saying we are chaining him only because, you know, for his own safety, and we can't look after him, and then what are we going to do now? Because the Supreme Court's reaction to any kind of thing like this is tell the state government to stop this. State government would react by just scooping up people, calling, tra tracking their families somehow, and sending them off. Removing chains, sending them off. No counseling, no figuring out why exactly they landed up here, where are the facilities close to them that they can go, none of that. So that's what, well, 27 people were taken and shunted back home to families which may or may not have been able to care or be there for them. So this talks about how, when he was there, his parents used to visit him, uh, but he spent something like 11 years of his life, and he's 21 now. The thing was, in this entire conversation, everyone spoke, but his voice was absent, and nobody seemed to bother about that. Next. So essentially what the final slide is all about, I mean, how do we get from here to there? I mean, we are like 2001 chains, 2019, 20, you're still going to have chains. Nobody is doing anything about the people who are getting chained. A lot of people from uh, Rajasthan and Orissa who don't have mental health issues, again, are being chained. And we're not looking at it as, at a, 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 as a holistic thing. We're not thinking about the family and where they're going and how are they going to. One person will have to stay off and leave a job or sacrifice on a job to uh, give care. We don't have any idea of where they've tried. There's no kind of uh, that, okay, maybe you may never get back to where you were, but you can still be functional, you can still do X, Y, Z, and these are your rights, and life is worth living. That's simply not there at all. So given the current state and given that, ultimately, I mean, we may say we may be working as activists in disability, in mental health, in human rights, in prisoners' rights, etc. but we are doing very little on the ground. You know, we're making a difference in whatever we're choosing to do, but as far as real change goes, no. I mean, look at it. 20, 30 years, zero. And we don't even have a plan or a solution or even a way of going ahead with this. So yes, like I said, I mean, a lot of what I proposed were very uh, mundane things like more budget, uh, where are all your mental health uh, you know, personnel? But yeah, and the whole, we talk mental health, but we mean mental illness. I mean, I would say 99% of the mental health community is only focusing on mental illness and severe mental illness, and yes, there's a reason. But instead of saying that we're looking at mental health, I think we need to start with accepting the mental illness and situation on the ground and to that's a term from the disability community, progressive realization. You start with mental illness, and somewhere along the line you reach mental health, because anything else you're kidding yourself. I mean, I would feel ashamed. I don't know about everyone else. That's it. Thank you.
think all the speakers can come up when then we can start taking questions. Since we've overshot a little with time, we'll take a limited number of questions and try to break 40 by 12. Yeah, is this someone going around? There's a question. So um, we can take maybe two, three questions and then move on. I think that will be faster. Uh, so my I have two questions. My first question is, uh, well, uh, Chandrasekhar Sir, uh, Yeshma Ma'am, and uh, even Amma Ma'am and uh, Vaishnavi Ma'am have all spoken about how uh, the terminology, there is a, like, because you have an anger pan, you're sending into a mental hospital, or, uh, so there's a lot of confusion in terminology and how people are just uh, associating ADHD with a little bit of restlessness. But my question comes in, uh, uh, as Reshma ma'am has spoken about kids who just speak about symptoms, but what about those people who are aware of the concepts, how the popular culture is depicting them today? Like Sheldon Cooper is the face of OCD, or just because you experience a little bit of, uh, maybe not a little bit, but extreme sadness people, themselves diagnose themselves with depression and so when we say awareness how are we supposed to uh, control this how are we supposed to uh, draw <coughs> draw a distinction between a mental illness and uh, heightened emotions and uh, my second question is to rahul sir who said that um, well, we have to use uh, medis medication in psychiatry because it works. But also at one point of time, even lobotomy worked and they did prescribe that, but we had to stop it because you well surgically removed a part of your brain. So, and we all, as Reshma Ma'am has said, you have to go out and you have to humanize, you have to go beyond, have conversation. So where do we draw the line for medication? When we know the short-term side effects and the long-term side effects, where do we draw a line for the dosage and the frequency of medication? So we can take another question. You have a question. Can I just request you all to keep your questions really brief so that you know the speakers have time to um, respond to them? Yeah. Okay, I'll keep it as short as possible. Yeah. Okay, my name is Tarun. I'm a graduate student at uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Hyderabad. Uh, my questions are to both uh, Vaishnavi ma'am and uh, Amba ma'am. Uh, uh, this is okay, uh, for both of you. You're working at the sort of intersection. You're also mental health and uh, disability, right? There is that. Mental illness has been identified as disability in both PWD at and uh, also in the RPWD at. Uh, I was wondering how is uh, how is uh, how is this identification for persons with mental illness as persons with disabilities actually helping on ground? What what is uh, how has the situation because it's, it has been since 1995. I was I uh, wanted to know how uh, like in terms of access to enter entitlements or for that matter uh, discrimination related. You can. Uh, do. And uh, for Vaishnava, particularly in your comparison between UK and India, the legislations, in the India side, of, like when you're talking about the OPG uh, for the UK legislation, I was, I was reminded of that NTA, which was the, the, the National Trust Act, which I think is covering similar, like, and this was in 1989, by the way. So I was wondering how, uh, like, is, is it because, is it because India, is, India was progressive or in that, or like, you can draw the, you can uh, tell us about the comparisons and also, uh, uh, regarding the slide where you showed the psychiatrist per state, uh, state-wise, uh, Tamil Nadu, like I was looking at the government side, Tamil Nadu had like more, far more higher number of uh, psychiatrists than any other state, far more. Where is, uh, how did this happen? This is because Tamil Nadu state was like since the beginning uh, progressive when it comes to mental health. Or, like, I, want to, I want to know your uh, comments. So would, would the speakers like to respond first and then we can take another round of questions. So, um, I, no, anyone can go first. I think yes, I think her question was about, um, you know, awareness and, and defining I you thought know, it was problems of like defining um, mental on, on illness. Over diagnosis or self diagnosis. That was my understanding on Okay, I, I'll just take up because I, I find it difficult. To f I'm going to forget uh, by the end, so I'm just going to jump in. So self-diagnosis, I think, is a, an issue which is quite limited in the, in the terms of the broader 
you know, the number of people and I know that it's something which Reshma has written about. I remember, uh, you know, and the thing is that if you've, you know, there are a lot of people who want to have a mental illness, but having lived with a mental illness, I can tell you that um, I would probably be much more functional without. But, I mean, in the sense that it's, um, I, I think that there is this, um, you know, this is, this is an issue that uh, I, I, I don't have a solution for, except for the fact that with more people talking about it, I mean, maybe it's a way of trivializing issues, I think, and, and that uh, probably needs an awareness perspective on, um, uh, I don't have any uh, submissions on, on medication, that's not, uh, but, but I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's kept me alive, so that's that. Um, <laughs> so, um, identification and, and Persons with Disabilities Act. So, the thing is that certification of Persons with Disabilities was around since 1995. Technically, you could get a disability certificate. However, nobody could get a disability certificate till about 2005 because that's when the diagnostic criteria came out. And, um, and, and according for people with mental illness, there's something called the IDEA scale, which was developed for a certification. However, that certification, one of the problems is that it's only issued at the district level. So for some uh, disability certificates, you can even get it at the PHC. But this requires only the district mental hospitals can do it. From what we've seen on the ground, it is an extremely arduous process. You have to go, some hospitals want you to get admitted for observation, what have you. But in the end, after getting admitted, after getting the certification, even if you get the certification, uh, in Tamil Nadu and other states, for example, you are not entitled to the disability benefit. So the disability benefit is given to everybody with a disability, but not people with mental illness. The rationale... Yeah, yeah, you can fudge an, a mental retardation certificate, as it's still called, but that's pretty much it. The reason why you're not given a certificate, um, the money is because, you know, it's, it's assumed that it's curable and then, oh my God, you'll be sitting on that government money until you get a reassessment. Various other things are given. People with mental illness are excluded from the National Skill Development Program, from a, a whole host of other benefits, people with mental illness are excluded. So. Um, and the last question which you had was on the National Trust Act. Now, we know that the, the reason for the National Trust Act really is because the Lunacy Act, which Sveshnavi referred to, covered a group of lunatics and idiots. Okay, this was the terminology. Lunatics were basically people with mental illness and, uh, and, and um, uh, idiots were people with developmental intellectual impairments. Now, the 1987 Mental Health Act included all people with mental disorders but specifically excluded mental retardation. So the, the parents groups had raised up saying that we are excluded from this, we need something. And so there was a lot of advocacy and lobbying. And you have the National Trust Act, which is a uh, hundred crores, I think, uh, uh, you know, and, and the, the income generated is used for various schemes. And there's provision for guardianship. Uh, there was a move for people with mental illness to be included under the National Trust because a lot of the schemes are around community living, etc. Parents groups have opposed this continuously, um, and this is yeah. Disabled, disabled sorry, disabled parents groups of persons with disabilities like autism, mental retardation, cerebral palsy, multiple disabilities opposed inclusion of people with mental illness under the scheme of the National Trust. What was your question? <laughs> oh, the, the, the psychiatrist, I have absolutely no idea. But then if you really look at it, Tamil Nadu's health system, even Tamil Nadu government uh, doctors are very proud of the thing. They keep giving it as an example for uh, the rest of the country. So uh, I really don't know. No uh. idea. Regarding that question about the various diagnoses and other things, I think one of the major reasons is same terms are used by the lay public and the professionals differently. In the common language, you use terms like depression, paranoia, obsessions. These are the way used in a common language by a lot of people. But to a mental health professional, they mean different thing. So there is a lot of difference there. So when I make paranoia as a disorder, 
it has got a different connotation. Whereas paranoia can be suspicious about something here. So it doesn't make a disorder. So th that distinction is, has to be clear before you label something as suffering from a psychiatric disorder. I think that often mistakes are made there. That is because of lack of communication between different people. Like, uh, say, for a lot of times we end up in courts for, to give witness, expert witness, a lot of miscommunication between the legal fraternity and what, as a mental health professional, I am talking. So that is one aspect of it. Regarding the medication seeds, from lobotomy to uh, now the medication, there is an evaluation of uh, scientific discipline of psychiatry. No doubt, medicines do have side effects, no one denies that, but the side effects don't occur in 100% of the people. It has got a percentage, and there are something like the minor side effects, some are major side effects, so you have to distinguish that. And ultimately, when a medicine is benefiting a particular set of symptoms, it has to be used. So unfortunately, as of today, there is no a particular etiological factor or causative factor for a mental illness. It's a group of uh, issues which can make an individual vulnerable to mental illness. And when there is a opportunity to heal some of the symptoms, I think it should be used judiciously. Yeah. Just, want, just wanted to uh, answer to that particular question because you had addressed it to me and uh, first of all thank you so much for that excellent question it's very important this Nobel Prize in 1940 I think for prefrontal lobotomy to a Portuguese neurosurgeon uh, and he appearing on the uh, postal stamps of uh, Portugal had kind of disturbed me for quite some time and I could never imagine that these kind of treatments uh, um, as a, I mean it's not it's not in history this is just uh, 80 90 years ago but it's not just with um, behavioral problems or uh, even today the radical surgeries which uh, are done in uh, cancer and many other areas are all, I mean, they, uh, a few years down the line we could very much say that this was as ghastly as prefrontal lobotomy. So what we must, I, I think as, as, as citizens or as common people, we, we must understand uh, uh, the philosophy of science and how it kind of progresses. Many a times we t tend to take it at complete, I mean it's like a hundred percent kind of, it's work in progress. Science is work in progress, things are developing, they are, they could be replaced over a period of time. Even the cholesterol guidelines are being revamped and kind of uh, uh, new guidelines are coming in. So, so there's nothing set in stone. S same is the case with medications. I, you might have taken, I mean, people might have taken a wrong message through my presentation that medications must be given. I never said that. I said that medications sometimes work. Uh, and uh, the most important point is that the person who suffers, not with mental illness, with anything, should be given a choice in terms of whether they need a medication. Uh, I'm, I'm a survivor of a cancer patient, so my, I lost my mother in, in uh, for, for can, can, uh, cancer of stomach. And I was really, it was, I mean, we talk about choice. She herself was a gynecologist, but she never had a choice in, in real terms. Uh, she just had to go through those radical surgeries, which were almost as ghastly as, as lobotomy. So we need, this is also work in progress, how we think of choice and uh, where, where the rights and choice of people come in. So uh, we, I don't think we have answers on, on that particular front, but it's good to keep asking those questions and try eliminating lobotomies uh, and similar things as soon as possible. Thank you. Can you use some mic so that, can you use the mic? I understand uh, that all the presentations were done out of concern and uh, the euphoria with which each one were presenting. But my only concern is how do you expect the state or the civil society's intervention in overcoming this challenge? Because hardly we see any kind of demands that is put forward by the particular community or a requirement in this domain, while right? there is other kind of aggressive agitations or requirement for the state's intervention and contribution. Uh, but how does one expect to overcome? These are all to be seen like a presentation or information or concerns out of uh, deep participation or your own involvement in that area or domain. But uh, the next subsequent session will be on the rights. That how does the state protect the rights of this is also a concern that should be addressed seriously.
uh, and doing something which will get through parliament. Because there's so many legislations which are pending. I mean, you have the whole transgender bill as an example. One perfect thing, then somebody, just like ours, in fact, like the Disability Act, I mean, the Standing Committee more or less understood where the community was coming from, more or less. Exactly the same with the disability legislation. Then it goes and, I mean, people are not ready, people are not aware, and mind you, standing committees are good because they are your representatives, and that's a small group from the larger group who have been exposed, who have learned, and who have evolved. So if they can understand it, why is the standing committee's voice not being respected more? That is something which really needs to be asked. So at the end of the day, even with the mental health legislation, each time there's like so many iterations, you no longer know what was in it initially or what uh, ultimately got passed. Yeah, so that's one big problem that is being faced. And as far as mental health goes, ultimately, nobody cares. If you ask me, nobody cares. So the states don't care. That's very, I mean, you can see. I, if you look at the DMHP, the DMHP was supposed to phase, I mean the NMHP, as far as the funding went, was supposed to phase out after three years. It's just like a beginning push. How many states continue? How many states are willing to spend on mental health at all? It's not coming as a freebie. In fact, yeah, my most radical suggestion was to just give up and make whatever your mental health schemes are or your plans are, remove it from this nonsense between center and state, make it into a central sector scheme like your Ayush. At least then maybe things will happen. Because left to the states, all we'll be doing is chasing. And then we'll have people in IMH also saying, why, why should I take somebody has come from uh, North India, why should I accept them over here? Only because we are taking, only because people are rescuing in uh, Chennai. There's, you can vaguely see where they're coming from, given that everybody is struggling with limited funds and limited resources. So that brings us back to courts and PILs. And sometimes that works. In some way or the other, for example, change is being forced by getting people out of the institution. So now they will be living in the community. How, nobody knows. There's not too much of focus. It's all very ad hoc. And this is actually judicial overreach. All of this should be provided for by the executive, not by the judiciary. And we're just keeping our mouth shut because at least let somebody do. It's a little bit like information. Nobody could go inside the mental hospitals unless until the NHRC uh, did. And now the court knows that there's no point in asking the governments to be in charge, so it has mandated the NHRC to go and visit all the mental hospitals at intervals and give a report. And for a very long time, those reports are the only information that is available. Today, if you ask me, maybe the superintendent of the mental hospital may know how many uh, people there are, how many men, how many women, whether that information is being used in any policy or you know any kind of analysis or study you have your examples plain old census data nothing and i'm not restricting it to just mental health districts which have high prevalence of blindness you would expect to thrust over there nothing there's a village in Kashmir in which a lot of the people are, are, uh, are, well, 90 and above percent of the people are deaf. Now, most probably it's some kind of consanguineous marriage, something, something small, isolated community kind of thing. But what are we doing now for decades now? We are only talking about, oh, this mysterious thing, and then some broad, some researchers will come and say, is this, maybe is that, there's more interest in actually figuring out what this is, rather than doing something about it, if it is likely to be consanguineous marriage, to do any kind of awareness regarding that, what about all the deaf people, how are they communicating with others, and nothing. 
So there's this disconnect. And for all your talk of data, nobody is using data. Remember that. So at the end of the day, even though the judges may not be very aware, even though now, for example, I know with Gaurav's uh, PIL, there are going to be issues. It's going to be, again, the government forcing the local government. The local government will take, sweep up, take everybody. Whoever doesn't have families will go and be uh, left in a government shelter. Whether abuse happens in that government shelter, no, we don't know. Again, there's no one authority. The National Trust Act is only for a select group. And, and really speaking, we have, in fact, a PIL in uh, Kerala about malpractices in therapy centers. Uh, that's like uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, etc. We don't even have a governing body for that as yet. There is no consensus. I mean, the states are not willing to commit to the uh, Clinical Establishments Acts and standards and things like that. So health is in crisis. And that is putting it very, very optimistically. Mental health is a Ghana and there's only the judiciary which is somehow uh, doing its own thing. And there is um, one or two the names that I mentioned, the Sheila Barses and uh, now the Gaurav Bansals of the world who are in their own way and in their own limited understanding making things better. I wouldn't say trying because they are somehow making things better. Um, depressed, no? I think I'm being given to understand that we'll have to close this session, unfortunately. Um, um, so we'll have, we will not be able to take any more questions. Uh, but I think all of these, um, uh, all of the speakers have raised really important questions. And, you know, I was uh, trying to put down some, uh, some notes uh, in my book and having some thoughts in my head. Um, as to you know, what are the kind of questions which are coming up through this um, um, uh, through this specific panel, um, and I think although some of the speakers may not have made it explicit, but it's sort of come through that you know there are there are very deeper questions raised as to you know definitionally how do we understand mental illness, right? Um, so Amba and Reshma they refer to terminology and how that becomes important, and I think somewhere also in the uh, sort of diversity of this panel, you also get the sense that in some sense perhaps part of the problem is also because we are not necessarily all speaking the same language when we say mental illness. So for instance, you know, when we refer to something as mental illness or mental disorder, uh, it, it again means a variety of different things to people in different contexts. So for some people, you know, um, like uh, Vaishnavi you sort of, uh, you know, mentioned the example of, you know, the, the stripping. I mean, for, for some, a symptom might actually be a form of resistance. It might be a sort of a political uh, movement. Uh, s someone might not self-identify as having a mental illness, but as, uh, so for some mental illness might be a sign of, you know, it might be diversity. Um, uh, so, some might prefer to, for, for some, a label of mental illness in the biomedical model might actually be destigmatizing. It might actually be enabling in various sorts of ways that, you know, I'm not, I'm not bad, but I'm, you know, I'm having this kind of, you know, disorder. And so therefore, medication there becomes enabling it, you know. And so therefore, even with treatment, it's, it's hard to sort of have a one-size-fits-all solution for, you know, as to what kind of policy or what kind of program, you know. I mean, there are, of course, medication has its, has its role. And for, for many, it has been enabling and empowering. And then there, for, but then there are also other difficulties. So then what do you do when your policies and programs are only talking about care in the form of medical care? Then that becomes a problem. So then there are, you know, voices which are articulating that what are the alternatives? What are the alternatives to psychiatry? What are the non-medical alternatives? And can we think of care, not care for, you know, mental health? So the mental health act which is you know which talks about care and the right to treatment it it still talks about care in terms of right to medical treatment it doesn't really talk about you know options and alternatives um, uh, it doesn't it doesn't talk about distress so dr chandrasekhar you know he talked about you know that there are mental health issues and then there are you know mental illnesses and very often there are problems of living so so this is the language of distress but then what is the state doing to address 
you know, the, the language of distress. That has to be addressed through other, through other moves, right? If you have, um, um, for instance, if you have, you know, suicides, you know, related to issues of caste or related to, you know, um, like, you know, farmer suicides, related to larger structural socioeconomic, then it becomes a problem when the only modality through which you can address it is through the language of health. Um, so I think these are some of the questions which have come up. And then the other um, uh, is the question of rights and, you know, foregrounding a, um, a rights perspective and looking at, you know, looking at human um, rights, uh, looking, taking a rights framework uh, and not just a policy framework and how a rights framework uh, which the CRPD has, um, has actually enabled and has, you know, um, done a lot for that. Um, uh, talking about from the perspective of user survivors and so therefore, you know, bringing in, bringing in um, personal narratives, first person narratives of, of mental illness, I mean that, that becomes important because then those, those narratives, they are not just narratives or they are not just stories, they are not just, you know, research or data, but it actually goes into framing of um, policy. So if we think about mental health from a human rights perspective, then what becomes, uh, what becomes important. Um, so I think some of, you know, these things have been um, touched upon, but um, we'll have to close the sessions. I'd like to thank all of you and the speakers. And uh, thank you so much to all the speakers and thank you for Shubha ma'am for filling in on short notice for us as a moderator. Uh, and now we'll break for tea. I'd request all of you to bring tea into the Sarklaw Center if possible so that we can um, start the next session by 12.15.